Alora. Written by Megan Linsky. Narrated by Candace Joyce. Prelude. Shadows moved in the small cabin below. Smoke furled from his tunneled mouth as he perched hungrily in the trees, branches bending underneath his metal claws. The light from his one eye scanned over the situation quickly. He dimmed it before he could be noticed. She couldn't know he was here. His mouth nearly dripped oil from the lust. This was it. The past three years, the past three hundred years, he had been waiting, plodding and planning, carefully drawing out each moment. This would be the hunt to end them all. In minutes, the last Anne Mortal would be his. She was too predictable. It was ridiculous to think she would imagine the boy would listen to her. It would only give him more time to make his move. There. That was it. The wolf had crashed through the window. He had her right where he wanted. He used the large bulk of his body to bring down the wall of the cabin, causing the entire house to crumble inward. He heard the screams of the boy and the terrified howls of his prize as they gazed upward at him in terror. There were three of them, two humans and the Anne Mortal. It would be so easy to take the Anne Mortal now, but to do so would be to lose what he really wanted— he instead focused on the one next to her, the small one with fear flooding her eyes. With ecstasy he smiled, opening his mouth wide and scooping up the cowering human below. She nearly slipped away, knowing of his plans, but he crunched his jaws down upon her leg and heard the satisfying, tantalizing snap of the bone. His mouth savored, but he denied himself. Human flesh never tasted half as sweet as an mortal, and if he wanted the an mortal, he needed the human. He pillaged through the forest before his little darling could even stop to breathe. She would follow. If she loved the boy, and he knew she did, she would give chase. He wouldn't need force. She would give herself to him willingly. Chapter 1. The Place Where She Lived The Anne Mortal lived in the woods, a forest that was made of tall majestic pines and birch trees whose bark glowed white in the dark. Kingly oaks thrummed deep mahogany in the light, leaves of more value than diamonds. When the trees bloomed in spring, they were greener and more precious than emeralds in the summer, more colors than a rainbow in the fall. At these trees' roots sprouted lady slippers and chrysanthemums, green shoots and mushroom sprouts. This woodland rolled over the earth in hills and slept by a large lake, which, back in the old times, was made of liquid sapphire, but now was simply a dulled turquoise. The Anne Mortal was a female. She had lived there longer than perhaps time itself could remember. Her name was Alora and she was the most beautiful creature the land had ever seen. Her knee-length hair was the rich brown color of the forest owls, cascading past her waist like the waterfalls that lay in secret beyond the trees. Her skin was the color of snow on an early morning sunrise, her cheekbones raised and elegant. The Anne Mortal's lips shone of pale rose, her legs long and graceful as the deer that danced nearby. She wore a white deerskin dress, jewelry made of shells and stones she had collected from the lake. Her eyes shone the color the lake once had been, shining sapphire, with a ring of emerald around her black pupils. She could have passed for a young woman, though no creature ever mistook her for one, or no human either, if they looked properly. Even though she had lived for centuries, the Anne Mortal remained at the age of sixteen, and, like all Anne Mortals, she was set in a certain way. In the spring and the summer, Alora lived as a girl. As soon as the last leaf fell and the first snow fluttered to the ground, 
she would go into a deep sleep to awaken as a pearly pelted she wolf, white coat flashing with the extravagance of clouds, on her back, two large and graceful swan wings. She would fly high above the land that the humans called Michigan's Upper Peninsula. It was the land the Anmortals refused to name, for the land was so achingly beautiful that if one allowed themselves to fall too far in love, their heart would only break. Although there were no fellow and mortals around, and no humans populated the place for miles, Alora wasn't lonely. She had the company of her horse, Tanglemane, to keep her happy and safe in the warm months. When the winter came, Tanglemane would run off with the deer and come back once Alora had transformed into a girl again. During the winter, Alora wandered alone. She had no family. Her parents, also and mortals, had flown off together during the winter very long ago. They did not come back. Her younger brother, Agathi, had stayed until he had reached his own particular and mortal age of twenty-one and would age no more. He left, lumbering into the snows with his great shaggy paws, to catch white fish and fight other bears. In the way of the Anmortals, he did not come back either once he had left. Alora missed them, but she did not want them to return. Anmortals always lived alone or with mates. They did not desire for company, and so Alora was never lonely. Time didn't exist for Alora. She would walk through the forest, barefoot in the spring. Flowers would sprout up where she had stepped. In summer, she rode like lightning through the tall trees on Tanglemane, and he would scare off the badgers and wolverines that ventured too close. In autumn, she would rise from beds of newly fallen leaves and go to the lakeshore to inhale its fresh scent. She would stand in the sand and the waves would crash around her like magic, making her feel alive. Winter, however, was her favorite. She would glide along the tips of pines, howling her way to the half-moon as the essence of clouds, cold and dignified, floated down and made a cloak upon her back as if crowning her queen. She would dance in the rain and scream to the thunder, proclaiming her love to the sanctifier, the one who was in the earth, that who owned her soul and would take it back one day when the world finally turned to stone and and mortals were no more. She was free. Nothing mattered more to Alora than her freedom. She never wanted anything more. But her rule could not last forever. The world that she knew changed forever the day that he came. Chapter 2 Shots in the Cabin she first saw him on a summer's day as warm as the sun's embrace. Alora and Tanglemane walked freely along a shelf of land above a river, their steps sending sand and rocks tumbling into the water. Tanglemane himself was as handsome as Alora was beautiful. He was coal-black, with a white blaze down his forehead that sharpened into an arrow point upon his nose— a patch of white on his haunches that was dotted with black spots. His spindly legs had two white socks in the front, hooves of darkest garnet. A stripe of silver appeared in his black tail, which was combed clean. It was the opposite of his mane, which hung in impossible knots and had been braided that morning with eagle feathers by Alora. His black eyes were young and patient, like Alora, Tanglemane didn't age. Alora was hunting. She ate no meat until the winter and she was in her wolf skin, preferring to survive on the berries and plants she harvested instead. Yet she had spotted an old injured stag only an hour ago and planned to put the poor animal out of his misery. She would gather what meat she could in her fur bag and take enough hide to make another dress. She then would leave the rest to the wolves. A quiver of homemade arrows hung from the bag, an elder bow strung across her back. Her father had made it for her before he left, and it had never shown a sign of age after decades of use. Before her wolfskin, she would hide it in the same pelt hut she called home, and go back to retrieve it in the spring. 
A child's giggle made them halt and turn their heads toward the river. They peered through the branches and saw two people fishing in a boat out on the water. One was a very large man, hair the color of grain and arms as big around as tree trunks. He tossed a fishing rod into the water and showed his son how to do the same. He was a three-year-old, with brass-colored hair, a very round nose with red cheeks. The child laughed and imitated him, giving out a cheer as the fly hit the water. Alora watched with interest. She had not seen man since the days when great chiefs and their warriors roamed the lands. That had been centuries ago, but to Alora it seemed like a couple of months. The boat itself was motorized. Tanglemane's ears flickered back and forth in interest at the engine's hum. "'Now easy there, August. Reel it in nice and slow,' the father said, demonstrating how. "'Like this, Daddy?' The boy jerked the bait roughly out of the water. The man had to duck to avoid being hit. "'Don't take out my eye!' The man grabbed the boy's arms and chuckled, smiling at his son. The child dropped his head and said, I'm never going to catch a fish. The man clapped his hand on the boy's tiny shoulder. Yes, you will. Besides, that's what this is for. The man pulled out a long rifle and shot it into the water. Tanglemane was spooked by the noise and ran off. Alora, who knew what guns were but had never seen one before, merely looked on with curiosity. Several stunned fish floated to the top of the river, the man gathered them up by hand, throwing them into a plastic box. I think that's called cheating, Daddy, the boy said with a giggle. The man's back was turned, so his face was impossible to read. I think it's called dinner. Your mother won't be happy if I come home empty-handed. Alora took a step backward, and her foot cracked on a branch. The man whipped his rifle around, pointing at the exact spot where Alora lay hidden behind the reeds. Daddy, what are you doing? The boy asked. Shush, the man commanded. There's something in the woods. Alora froze. The man was still, his finger on the trigger. Alora looked into the barrel of the gun that was aimed directly between her eyes. Finally, he let the gun down. Must have been a bird, he said. Come on, little man. Let's go home. The man fired up the engine, and Alora watched it sail away. It was long gone before she turned around to call for Tanglemane. It's too dangerous here, my friend, she told him softly. From now on, we must learn to be careful. While Alora was picking flowers by a pond one day, she and Tanglemane heard the brush crackling. Tanglemane's head rose up. He put his ears back as a warning, but Alora shooed him into the trees. The girl gathered up the wet ends of her deerskin dress and hid behind the reeds, peering out to observe what was disturbing her peaceful afternoon. It was only the child, August. But what was he doing here? His parents weren't around. Alora suspected that he wasn't supposed to be out on his own, not at such a young age. The boy threw rocks into the water and watched the ripples, his eyes catching the sight of a spotted green toad. The child squealed. His hands reached out to catch it, only to have his sandals slip on the sleek rock, tumbling into the water. The pond was several feet deep at its lowest places. The boy sank right down to the bottom like weights were on his legs. Alora sprang into action, jumping into the water and swimming forward with the skill of a river trout. She took a deep breath and dove down, groping through the muggy water for the toddler's fingers. She couldn't see. It was like sloughing through slimy moss. Every particle of filth clung to her as she struggled to seek the boy out through the plants and the darkness. Finally, she had his arm. Alora swam upward, kicking her feet until her legs burned. Her eyes sought upward to the surface twelve feet above— her body became entangled in the weeds, and she was trapped, struggling as she tried to force her way to blissful freedom. She needed to breathe. She was going to be imprisoned here forever. The boy must be saved, she thought, and as a last resort she tried pushing the boy above her. 
the pond splashed. Alora wrenched herself free, glimpsing Tanglemane's legs and grabbing onto his neck with one hand while the other held the boy. She gasped for air as Tanglemane pulled them to land and freedom, each intake of air feeling like a dagger repeatedly stabbing in and out of her throat. She lay the boy on his back and pressed into his chest a few times. Minutes passed and he did not stir. Breathe, child, she said, exhaling deeply into his throat. He came around, sputtering water out of his mouth with tears in his eyes. When his eyes opened, she saw that they were the same colors of the things she loved. The rustic brown of forest wood, the deep mahogany she treasured most. His mouth dropped open when he saw her, and he stuttered, Who, who are you? She smiled at him, her mouth forming dimples. I am Alora, August. How do you know my name? He asked in wonder. She pulled him to his feet and responded honestly. I've seen you before. I'm concerned about you. Why are you here without your mother and father? August averted his eyes. There was yelling at the house. I ran away, though Mommy told me not to. You should not disobey her. Come. Alora held out her hand, and the boy took it gently. They walked through the forest together. The boy gazed up at Tanglemane in awe as the horse followed them, as if he had never seen anything like him. August let out a small, soft sneeze. Alora glanced at him sharply. If she didn't get him home soon, he could catch something. Sickness wasn't picky with who it chose to inhabit, especially not here, in the forest. Where do you live? Alora asked, her eyes staring straight ahead. Up there. The boy ripped his eyes away from the horse and pointed to a hill away from the trees. The child and girl climbed up it, Tanglemane drifting away. A simple log cabin with a stone chimney sat directly under the noonday sun, newly constructed and the only permanent building Alora had seen in her life. The grass of the hill came up to the girl's knees. She knelt down next to the toddler to meet his gaze. This is where I say goodbye, she said. She grasped his shoulder, which was still dripping wet. You won't go away, will you? I'll see you again, he asked, lip quivering. She smiled. She couldn't promise that. But his face was so stricken that she said, Perhaps you will see me one day, if you come into the woods again. With that, she gave the boy a small peck on his cheek. The boy made a disgusted face and wiped off her kiss with his hand. He walked back toward the house and opened the screen door, turning around to see the strange girl one last time. He saw her astride Tanglemane. The horse dipped his head as she waved a farewell. August blinked once, and just like that, they were no longer there. The boy went into the cabin, but from the trees, the Anmortal watched. He said goodbye to her but she wasn't ready to say goodbye to him. The summer grew long and stretched into autumn, and all the while, Alora continued her watch over the boy. At first she ran into him only occasionally, while collecting brush for a fire or berries for food. He never saw her as she kept hidden in the trees. Soon, however, Alora found herself searching the child out, watching as he played hide-and-seek with imaginary friends or picked flowers for his mother. The woman often yelled at the child, and Alora didn't know why. The flowers he picked were very lovely, after all. On the eve of the first snowfall, when Alora could feel winter in her bones, she and Tanglemane watched as August played in the leaves joyfully, frolicking around from pile to pile. He tossed them up and laughed as they came tumbling down. He buried himself inside them, and Alora had to smile. Even though it had almost been a thousand years, she could remember when she was just like him. The sun began to set, bathing the land in honey gold and molten orange. Tanglemane nickered to her and bowed his head. Alora took it in her hands and kissed the swirl in the middle of his forehead, then buried her face in his gnarled mane. This was their goodbye until spring. When Alora let go, 
the stallion turned and went to join the deer for their migration to warmer parts. Alora folded her legs and collapsed upon the ground, lying under an elm tree to sleep and take the change. August had long gone home by now. Each patch of sunlight finally vanquished from the earth, and as her eyes closed, a whirlwind of ice and snow swirled around her. Wolf replaced girl, and when she woke the next morning, she howled in triumph at the frost decorated on the elm wood. A small puddle had frozen to ice next to where her head lay, and she turned to gaze in it, admiring her wondrous reflection. She had a thin build, but her eyes were the wild ones of an anmortal. She stretched her large swan wings and shuddered as they hurt for being folded within her soul for so long. She was the size of your basic she-wolf, but when thinking this to herself, she cackled. Wolf she was indeed, but she was so much more. Alora decided to stay without a pack this year. After all, she was powerful, intimidating in her stance. She needed no one to survive or to depend on, and why would she bother ruling over a group when she could take command of her entire realm? Alora made hunts every few days and played in the snow, chasing rabbits into holes and irritating bears for pure fun. Alora usually wouldn't make such a fool of herself, but she always felt playful in the first month of winter. Besides, anyone who would dare retaliate at her antics would surely die at her fangs. She owned this world. Her dignified behavior would come with the new year, but as for now, it was time for some fun. On the fortnight of her wolfskin, Alora saw strange shapes in the snow, large patches of creatures with heads and wings. She stopped running and observed the imprints to realize that they were, what did humans call them? Snow angels. She remembered the boy whom she had rescued and realized that he must have made them. She recalled the way the vines had held her in the water when she had dove in after him, and she shivered. It was not the prospect of death that had scared her, but the thought of her body being trapped forever, held in murky jail. Her soul would have fled, of course, to take up permanent residence with the sanctifier in the earth, but she still didn't like the idea of her shell remaining trapped. She wondered how the boy was faring. He seemed well when she had left him, but she had only seen him from a distance since then, and this winter was a cold one so far. She hoped he wasn't ill. Being an unmortal, she couldn't get sick, but she hated the suffering of those that could. It took three days, but finally, Alora decided to stop her wondering. There was a wicked blizzard coming, but Alora didn't mind. She decided not to chance flying, and instead ran headlong into the snow with all her might, baying at the challenge of the fiendish weather. As she howled and cried, the animals in their hallows quivered. She sounded much wilder and more frightening than any beast ever could. When Alora reached the cabin, she fell several feet deep into snowdrifts, plummeting into holes that were life-threatening to anyone but her. Alora laughed at the face of death. Her tongue lulled as she struggled to gasp for air between her laughter, believing nothing her equal. Alora padded up to the cabin walls, wanting to look inside. To her insult, she circled the house and saw that curtains veiled every window. Alora pouted. Nothing had been hidden from her in the forest before, and she wasn't about to let the boy's condition be kept secret from her either. Determined to find a way in, she waited. At last, the father exited the house in his winter clothing to carry wood into the cabin. He was so cumbered by the heavy load, he only shut the door halfway, leaving a small crack that Alora would be able to open. Alora pressed her nose against the door. The winged wolf slunk onto the carpet, snow falling off of her in chunks. The man and woman were busy tending the fire in the small den down the hall, and noticed nothing as she entered. She crept quietly into each room, leaving wet tracks and snow trails, until she had found the child. He was sleeping peacefully in a large wooden crib. Her face softened as she saw him. Clearly, he was all right. There was no flush to his face, no agony scrunched up in his eyes. He was perfectly well, 
at ease in the marvelous place that was Dreamland. She sat down and sighed, her tail wagging back and forth as she looked at his tender face. Alora turned around and looked at the open door. His parents wouldn't hear a thing. All she had to do was pick him up in her teeth and carry him out the way she had come. He was fast asleep. He wouldn't wake up until she had taken him far away from here. Should she? He was a treasure, a precious thing. She wanted him for herself. But no, it would be wrong to snatch the boy from his parents. She was mischievous, but she was also a queen, and that meant she must not be a thief. A tingle in her stomach sensed danger, yet she pushed it aside. She was truly a free being, wasn't she? She could do as she pleased without consequence, and right now she wished to stay here and watch the boy dream. She drew her face close to his, never feeling more content as her nose touched his own. A high-pitched scream told her she had stayed too long, had been too arrogant. Her head whipped around to see the woman standing in the doorway, pointing in horror. It was seconds before the man was there, holding something long and lethal in his hands. She heard a playful giggle by her side. She turned her gaze back on the boy, who had awoken at his mother's scream. Their eyes locked onto each other and reached an unspoken understanding. He knew who she was. The man beside her raised his gun and fired. The shot barely missed Alora and hit the window next to the crib instead, causing the glass to shatter into millions of pieces. Alora didn't waste any more time. She leapt out the broken window, her heart pounding like a war drum. Alora didn't stop running until she had reached the comfort of her stone den and was out of breath, out of reach. The child's wailing and the firing of the gun could still be heard echoing, no, vibrating in her mind and muscles. As Alora entered the safety of her chosen cave, she whimpered, trying to drown out the horrible sounds. Her limbs shook as she lay down. Not including the pond incident, she had never felt true fear before. No creature had dared attack her, no threat had come to call. Nothing had ever posed a real threat. Only man was arrogant enough to believe themselves a challenge to her rule. No, she was wrong about that. There had been one other time, when she was very small, that she had been fearful. But even that didn't count. It had been curiosity more than anything, an old story. How had it gone again? Alora. What are you doing over there? Her mother had shouted. She had been a beautiful and mortal, with limbs as long as her shimmering hair. Alora, a little girl then, was trying to lean as far as she could off the side of the cliff they were standing on, while her brother watched eagerly. I'm trying to float on the clouds, Mercia, Alora had said, like in the stories of the Windcomer. The Windcomer? Her brother had hissed, amused. That's just a story Macasto tells you to send you off to sleep at night. Your father is right, her mother had said. A serious look had come upon her face. The windcomer is quite real. Now really, Agathi had protested, shaking his head. A giant metal beast who eats and mortals? No such thing. There is, and you would do well to listen to me. Your great-grandfather was taken by him— I watched him being eaten alive, Mercia said sadly. Her gaze looked out at the great lake, at something Alora couldn't see. Agathi had rolled his eyes, yet Alora listened intently. Why didn't he run away? she asked. And mortals can run very fast. Mercia had shaken her head. There's no use trying to run. The windcomer catches up every time. Yes, Alora, you'd better watch out or else the windcomer will eat you up and you'll be trapped in his giant iron stomach with the other Anmortals that have shared your fate, Agathi mocked. Why does he eat us? There's plenty of other food, Alora protested, backing away from the cliff as she hung on to her mother's every word. Mercia still watched the lake. Some say the Anmortals he eats makes him stronger. Some say they make him immortal. Others say 
He just likes the taste. Then why don't the Immortals, all of us, band together to fight him off? Alora had asked. Nothing should get in the way of our freedom. Mercia had laughed then. You can't kill the Windcomer, she chuckled. No one can. Alora shook her head. Fairy tales or not, she still was curious about the myth of the Windcomer. She never had been able to pry much out of her parents about the mythical beast, and Agathi was so doubtful about his existence he was no help to her at all in her search. She had never met another and mortal who could tell her much more. There were always plenty of legends, though, about other monsters. Not one of them, however, caught her interest like the Windcomer did. He was the only story that had ever scared her. Being jailed forever inside a great iron stomach was Alora's ultimate punishment, the pinnacle of losing her liberty. The sound of the gunshot exploded in her mind again, blasting away the image of the windcomer. Alora chastised herself for letting her mind ramble, and she let metal monsters fall out of her thinking. Alora began pacing, her paws slapping onto the stone. One thing was clear to her now. In her girl form, she could easily pass for a human, able to slip past the eyes of the unobservant humans with grace. As a girl, she would be loved and treasured by man, accepted as one of his own. As an immortal, however, she would be hated and hunted. For the first time in her long life, her wolf skin wasn't a symbol of her regal superiority, but a status that was fatally dangerous. Chapter 3 The First Summer Many years passed since her encounter in the cabin. Alora watched the boy as he grew up. She hid in the shallows of the chilly snow in wolf skin. She trotted after August silently on Tanglemane's back in the summer. Then everything changed. When the boy was ten, he left with his mother in the dead of winter on a silent night, leaving the man behind. She did not see August for six years after that. Alora continued on with her life, hunting and riding and wandering through the land, tending to the woods after fires and long droughts. After the shedding of her wolfskin for the seventh time since the boy vanished, Alora went down to the pond to take a drink. It was the same one she had nearly drowned in, though her anmortal memory had long forgotten this by now. This simple task, however, was disrupted by an old visitor. Alora casually slunk around a tree, wondering if the footsteps she heard were the ones of an animal. She saw no animal, but instead something of much more interest. It was the boy, but he was not so much a boy now as he was a man. He was more muscular than before, around six feet tall. His face had chiseled features, deep, hollowed eyes, and a broad chin. It was an understatement to say he was handsome. Indeed, Alora had never known a person to look so appealing. The smile he had worn as a boy was vacant from his face. He glared at the pond as he cast rocks into it roughly, at the exact spot he had fallen in years ago. As he did so, Alora's nose scrunched up. Alora didn't like seeing August angry. It seemed wrong to her. She crept out of the bushes and asked, Why are you so upset? His back was turned, so her voice surprised him. He jolted on the rock, feet flying everywhere. He would have fallen if Alora hadn't grabbed his arm at the last moment. With his mouth nearly touching the ground and his lungs heaving for breath, August turned. He looked at the person who had been his savior. Alora giggled and said teasingly, Want to go for a swim? I can surely oblige. You scared the hell out of me, the boy said, shaking his head and putting a hand to his chest. What's the big idea, sneaking up on me like that? If you were more observant, then maybe you'd notice I was sneaking, Alora said. His gaze locked on hers. Who are you? He tilted his head and made a twisted face as he looked at her strange clothing. Alora's interest peaked, so he didn't remember. It had been many years since he last saw her, of course, and at a very young age at that. Should she tell him about their former meeting? 
The blankness in his eyes was too much of a temptation to resist, so she decided to play along with his game. I'm Alora. August smiled slightly. Well, it's nice to meet you, Alora. I'm August. They stood in silence for a moment before he asked, So, have you lived up here a while? She tilted her head. A while? What about you? Only my whole life. He shrugged. Well, most of my whole life. I lived with my mom a couple of years down south. Down south? Alora asked. Was there even such a place? Yeah. He gestured forward. You want to take a walk? Sure. August headed away from the pond. The odd couple began clumping through the brush, weaving their way out of the tall weeds and onto a path. When they were away from the pond, August asked, So what do you do for fun around here? Alora shrugged. I explore the woods. No matter how much of the forest I know, there's always a part I haven't seen. I've noticed there's a lot of wildlife. August stated. That's good for hunting. Do you hunt? Oh, yeah. I haven't got to in ages, but I'm going out soon. I'm the best shot in these woods for miles. Really? Alora asked, suppressing a smile. So hunting was another thing they had in common. Yep, I've never missed a target, not since I was a little kid. They began heading toward the direction of the beach. August glanced at Alora out of the corner of his eye, his face was screwed up in concentration. Alora, where have I heard that name before? You look familiar. Do I? Perhaps we have met? Alora suppressed her bemused grin. Maybe, August said, rubbing his chin. Perhaps it's the name of someone you knew before. I don't think so. You never answered my question, Alora said. What? August asked. Why were you upset? Alora stated. You seemed unhappy. August's face fell into a deeper frown. I don't really want to talk about it. I just want to help, Alora offered. You can tell me anything you wish. August frowned. I have to go. I'll see you around. He began walking toward the direction of his home. Alora longed to follow him, but for a reason she did not know, she stayed put. Alora was traipsing through the woods one afternoon when she saw August throwing out a fishing line on the side of a stream, sitting patiently in the sand and waiting for his lunch to take a bite. Alora hid in the woods and peered out, her curiosity burning with enchantment. What a strange thing he was. His eyes were round and soft, his hair untangled, so clean, and features rough instead of fair. Yet he seemed wonderfully different and the scent of his young skin tantalized the senses in her nose and mouth. Alora hid a girly smile behind her hand. She liked what she saw, and what Alora liked, she got. Alora formulated an idea. She swam into the stream from a point where August couldn't see, diving underwater until she was directly below his line. She tugged on it, and he, thinking he had caught something, pulled back. With a smile, she grabbed the line with both hands and yanked him into the water. He sputtered up out of the muddy stream, his face twisting into one of great surprise and anger when he saw her. He cleared out his mouth and spat, Halora, what are you doing? Making you wet, she smiled, and she shook her hair until droplets spattered his face. He scowled, You scared away all the fish. Alora giggled, you won't find any fish here on this side of the stream. I've never caught anything on this edge. If you want to fish, go to the lake. August sighed. He gathered his things and said, Thanks for the tip. He began making for the west. Alora glided up out of the water and placed her hand on a rock. Where are you going? He turned and pointed with his rod. To the lake, like you said. You'll never get there that way, she chuckled. There's a quicker path through the woods. Through the woods? That's going in the wrong direction, he protested. She smiled, lifted herself onto her feet, and leaned close to his ear. Trust me. She then fled into the trees. August couldn't help but to follow. Alora, with her Anne Mortal Grace, weaved in and out between branches as if she could fade right through them. 
August, however, broke through the brush clumsily. Alora had been waiting for August for five minutes before he emerged from the bushes, heaving for breath. She led him to a comfortable spot, and they sat down by the lake shore. August cast out his line. As they waited, the sun dried them both off, and a gentle breeze blew through their hair. Within a few minutes, August had caught a fish. His irritation quickly dissipated. He put the catch inside his cooler and asked, How do you know where all the good places to fish are? My people have been here for ages, and so have I, she said. Well, thanks for bringing me here, August said. He placed a bag next to the cooler and asked, You hungry? I always pack extra. What is it? Just a sandwich. Having never heard of such a thing, but not wanting to appear a fool, Alora nodded. August gave one to her. She took a bite and smiled, swallowing. Venison, my favorite. You any good at hunting? August asked, amused by how much she enjoyed the meat. Alora gave him a foxy look. Very good. Probably better than you. Well, I don't know about that, he said, chuckling. Alora cocked an eyebrow but held her tongue. She was about to ask if he had ever fallen a moose with nothing but his teeth, but she thought better of it. By the way, he said, I'm sorry about walking off on you the other day. I got in a fight with my dad, and that's the reason I was mad. I'm sorry I didn't want to tell you. You didn't have to tell me anything, Alora said. I only wanted to help. Oh, really, he said. I know I've been a jerk to you. I'm not used to living up here. I just moved back in with my dad. I had to leave all my old friends behind. And to be honest, I don't really fit in here. It's been really hard. Alora put a hand on his shoulder. Leaving home is difficult. But hopefully this can be your new home. I hope you're right. I just feel awful about how I've treated you. He cracked a crooked smile. Well, until you pushed me in the pond, anyway. That was just to be funny, Alora said. August smiled bigger. Well, in that case, you won't mind if I do this. August put his fishing pole aside and grabbed her, dragging her out into the water. August! She cried. He ignored her pleas, and they both dove into the rippling, freezing waves, laughing as they did so. Chapter 4 the story of the windcomer. On a most blustery and stormy night, Alora trotted up to August's cabin door, using her deerskin coat as a shield from the torrent of rain. Alora didn't bother knocking. She entered the unlocked door with the regal air of a princess, throwing her cloak upon the floor as if she herself owned the place. But yet, didn't she? She knew this forest from the inside out had lived here for centuries upon centuries. Didn't any dwelling, human or otherwise, if placed on her land, was her property? August came into the hallway. He nearly dropped the poster he was holding as he saw her, thinking she was a burglar. The shadow of the lamplight lit her face, and he sighed in relief. Oh, Alora, I didn't hear you knock. Come in, I'm set up in the living room. Alora followed him, her steps rippling like shadows on the walls. She looked around at the curious furnishings that were inside the house. So many odd and strange things were here. She couldn't name a use for so many. She supposed that most were for decoration. She came into contact with a copper sculpture of a long, curved reptile, rising up on his hind legs and flicking his tongue out at her. It reminded her of the windcomer. Alora shrank away from it as if burned and turned away, shielding her eyes from its gaze. She didn't understand why, but something about it seemed odd. Thanks for offering to help me, August said. He threw a package of writing utensils on the floor. I don't think I could have finished this project alone. It's no trouble, Alora said. She shut the door behind her, blocking out the gaze of the copper beast, and knelt down on the floor next to the warm, blazing fireplace. August moved closer and gave her a marker, his fingers lingering on her skin for just a second before he pulled away again. These are my notes from class. Can you copy them down? Alora looked at the sheet of paper he gave her blankly. I can't read. August paused. You can't read? Didn't your parents ever send you to school? My parents taught me different things. Alora let her mind wander. 
like stories about great metal beasts, those that fly on the wind and eat you whole. He stared at her for a second, before his voice became polite. I'll teach you how, August promised. Come over to my house every day, from now on, after I get home from school. Nobody should be unable to read. If you say so, she said. August looked down and said, Well, I'm glad for the company. Thanks for being here. It's so boring when I'm alone. Alora understood. She'd secretly wandered to the place where August went to school and watched from the trees as he lurked alone. The others ignored him if they weren't downright picking on him. He had no friends. Alora longed to interfere, but she could not expose herself to so many humans, not at once. August worked on his poster, and Alora observed. She noticed the way his face made different emotions when he wrote, the way his fingers tightened and loosened around the markers. His foot would twitch to an imaginary beat. A few times, his face was bent up in so much concentration that it made Alora laugh. He would pause when she did this. When he asked what was wrong, she said nothing, only smiled playfully. Alora took up a marker and began doodling on the poster, making squiggly lines that were shaped into the image of the river that ran into itself and transformed into trees and rocks and skies. August let out an exclamation of protest at first, but when he saw how amused she was by the colors coming out of the markers, he sat back and let her do as she pleased. Soon, the poster was decorated with the most beautiful designs. August observed them in awe. As the rain pattered on the roof, Alora opened her mouth and began to sing in the loveliest voice that August had ever heard. When the moon is high and the snow is gone, and the lake has grown stronger than the sea, when monsters roam and all is dark, I will bring you back to me. The earth will crumble into the lake, and what was will not be. But our love will never die. We will be forever a part of the stars, forever lights in the sky. August dropped the marker he was holding in his hand. He reached slowly to pick it up, his gaze never leaving Alora's face. As she continued to sing, a light bulb popped in the room and the glass mirror on the wall suddenly broke. As if on cue, the fire was blown out in the hearth, and a great rumbling shook the house. Out of the corner of her eye, Alora could swear she saw a smooth shape whip away into the darkness outside. August leapt up in alarm, but once he rose to his feet, the lights flickered and went out. "'What's going on?' Alora asked, peering into the dark. The storm must have knocked out the power, August said. Hold on, I'll go find us some candles. Don't leave without me, Alora said, leaping up and playing every part the frightened girl, as was her plan. She stumbled into August, on purpose, and mortals never stumble, and he tripped, slamming into a side table. Ouch! He hissed in pain. All right, but be careful. I don't want you tripping down the stairs. I will she promised. She followed August into the basement and helped him carry up lanterns, watching his every movement. August lit the candles and they sat gazing into the perfection of each other's faces. My dad won't be home tonight, not in this weather, August said. He'll probably stay in town. It's not safe to go out in this storm. Do you want to stay the night? Alora's eyes glimmered. If this is an invitation to, then of course. August brought out a blanket, wrapping it around her shoulders very lightly. You can sleep on the couch. I'll be in my bedroom down the hall. Are you really going to leave a lady all alone on a night like this? Alora pleaded, fluttering her eyelashes. He smiled lightly. Okay, I'll sleep on the lounge chair. Are you afraid of storms? Something like that, Alora purred. Her eyes watched him as he headed into the kitchen and came back with a platter, filled with a small treat. You hungry? It's cake. What is cake? Alora asked, tilting her head. 
August laughed and said, Here, try some. He cut her a bite and fed it to her on a fork, laughing as he saw her eyes light up. She took the plate from him quickly and said, I think I enjoy cake. He laughed again and started in on his own giant slice. Alora closed her eyes and chewed happily, feeling as if she were in heaven. Was there no end to the wonders this boy could show her? Alora, he asked tentatively, I hope I'm not being rude, but why do you dress the way you do in deerskins? She paused. She wasn't sure how much she could reveal to August, but something inside her told her he could be trusted. It's what my people have always worn, she said truthfully. I don't like modern clothes. They just aren't me. Are you a part of a native tribe? August asked. Is that why you don't go to school with me, because you live on a reservation? Alora hesitated. August wouldn't understand if she told him she wasn't human. I was taught at home, she said carefully. Not very well, if you don't know how to read, he said. I was taught the important things. I can take care of myself, August. She smiled. Trust me. The light from the candles flickered across August's face, and he wiped his mouth, saying, So you know any scary stories? Alora finished and put the plate aside gently. I know one. Do you want me to tell you? Sure, try and scare me, he dared. Alora sat up straighter. She hardly moved a muscle as she began to recite. A long, long time ago, when the lakes were freshly born, my people traveled together all over the widespread of earth. Each family combined with another to make a large, long chain of kin that would be inseparable. We lived together, played together, and ate together. We were the most feared and most beloved creatures alive. Alora's tone became dark. Things changed when my people made a grave mistake. You see, my race is a very vain one, and we can never admit that we're wrong. Our pride is our greatest downfall, and it led to arguments among our families. At first, they were over large things like land, but soon it came down to bickering over tiny little factors that never really mattered. The wind whistled, and Alora continued. In the end, two females began arguing who was prettier and who should marry the son of our leader. Over time, the two became mountainous in their jealousy. Our leader threw his spear at them out of his annoyance, running them both through. Gross. August wrinkled his nose. It's a legend that my people were able to do magic, Alora continued. But only true love can create miracles. And since the son of the leader loved neither, the two women died on that day. Ever since, our people have been divided. We live alone. There has never been another great family. Alora felt a bit of sadness as she pondered this. And mortals were magic and made of magic, but they could only create miracles together, and the time when her people could live in harmony had long been dead. That's creepy, August said, eyebrows raised. That's not all, Alora said. Her eyes were murky, dull, as if she was remembering past painful events. It is said the blood that ran into the ground from the dying females tasted delicious to the earth. The next day, it spat up a creature so terrifying that all quivered in its shadow. The earth beast slithered through the air and swallowed my people one by one, keeping them prisoner in his large iron belly. To keep ourselves alive, we separated further, traveling in pairs or alone. It was many a century until the beast became full from all his slaughtering and dissolved into the clouds, watching and waiting for his stomach to grow so he could take another prisoner for his own. What was his name? August said. Alora shook her head. His name is the one that brushes my skin in the breeze, and yours too, if you listen and feel. What happened? He asked. What do you mean, what happened? How did they kill it? You know, the thing. Alora laughed then, but it was a cold, chilling laugh. He's still alive. His paw steps are in the traces of the sky. 
Every cloud that you set your eyes upon are his footprints. Every whispering whimper in the night, his trail. He wouldn't harm you, but me. Alora shivered. How true is that story? August asked, skeptically. Did the murders really happen? I'm not sure. My mother told me, and I always thought it was true. She sighed. Now that I am older, it seems like the stuff of fairy tales. Lightning flashed outside the window, and it lit up their faces, causing their pupils to dilate and the whites of their eyes to be darkened out. You think he's out there, then? August teased, ready to gobble you up. I could see how anyone would want to gobble me up. It's no doubt that I taste delightful, Alora teased. August laughed loudly until his smile faltered. You never told me his name, he reminded her. Her smile left her face. She could swear the ember eyes of the lizard in the other room were glaring at her, burning holes into her back. The Windcomer The next afternoon, August found Alora on the lake shore instead of the other way around. He watched her from afar with a gleam in his eye, a tender happiness blossoming up in his bosom and spreading throughout. He watched her as she sat in the sand, making swirls in the dirt. He came to her side and plopped downward. What are you doing? She dug her hands into the sand. Building sand creations. It's an art form. An art form, he laughed. She cocked her head and said cheekily, If you don't think so, let's have a contest, you and I. A contest for what? A sand building contest. If you win, you get to ask me a question and I have to answer. But if I win... Then I can ask you my question, and you must answer. Deal, August said. We'll build until the tide reaches that rock, Alora pointed. Are you ready? Go! August began building a small castle that was falling apart at its misshapen lumps. He looked over at Alora's project and saw that she moved like a sprite, dancing in the sand, creating beautiful strokes with the dirt and stones. August cheated and kept building through the time they were supposed to stop, but Alora was so into her work she never noticed. Her eyes glazed over what she had made, until the water was well past the rock and splashing onto her feet. She gave one last small stroke and stepped back, eyeing her project with a dreamlike trance. August came to her side and stared, open-mouthed with awe. It was a painting made of sand, a living model of the hills and mountains, lakes and rivers— forests and meadows of the surrounding area. Every field was tended to, every sandy tree sculpted into an amazing detail. Tiny bushes made of rocks sat next to little waves that looked exactly like their actual counterparts. In the middle of the sculpture was the front half of a wolf, rising up out of the sand, her paws clambering for a way out, her eyes looking toward the sun. The picture sung of loneliness, sorrow, and freedom all in one breath. How did you do that? He asked, his eyes raking over the scene. Alora looked away. When you are the only one in your world, you tend to find ways to entertain yourself. It's incredible, August breathed. Yes, Alora said. But as always, with most things, it will be washed away. No sooner than she had spoken, a wave crashed onto the first part of the art, and washed a little bit away. August jumped forward to try and build a barrier, but Alora threw out an arm to stop him. He stared at her in disbelief as she stood there and watched her hard work be swept into the sea. Why did you even bother? August asked. Alora shrugged. If you have a dream that you can never accomplish, don't you still dream it anyway? I still seek joy in things, even though much of what I do fades. Seems so useless, August murmured sadly. To you, maybe. Alora brushed her hands off and turned to him. I think you owe me an answer to a question, since you obviously lost. Oh, really? Because I think my castle may stand a chance, he said, chuckling. Not the way I see it. Alora pointed as August turned to see his castle demolished, little more than a lump of sand. August had to smile, too, once he heard Alora's pretty laugh. He laid down on the sand again and asked, Okay, so what do you want to ask? 
Alora wasted no time. She laid down next to him, turning her head, and said innocently, Where did your mother go? August's smile turned into a frown. It's not really important. I can tell it bothers you. Alora didn't understand she was being too forward. It was the way she was. August's face melted as he caught the curiosity in her gaze. He sighed and rubbed a hand across his eyes. She and my dad split up a few years ago. She took me with her for a couple of years, but we didn't get along, so I left and moved back here. Why did she leave? Alora asked. August put his hands behind his head. She hated it out here. I mean, she absolutely hated it. She lived in the city, in sunny places, and she didn't love Dad enough to stay. She shouldn't have married him, then, Alora said bluntly. August picked up a rock and threw it into the lake. You aren't very subtle, are you? What does that mean? Alora asked. August shook his head and said, Never mind. They were silent for a minute, watching the clouds drift quietly by and listening to the waves of the shore wash along the beach. Alora leaned forward. All right, even though I won, I'll let you ask me a question. August gave her a cocky grin. Fine. What's that? he asked, pointing with his finger. Alora turned. A wave of surprise washed through her as she saw Tanglemane, rigid in his stance and watching her movement, in plain view on the beach. I see you ride him through the woods, August said, when I'm out walking some days. So she hadn't been able to hide this from him, but the thought of him being interested in her horse excited her, so she said, That's Tanglemane. He's lived here just as long as I. Does he listen to you? Does he? Alora called to him. Tanglemane instantly trotted over, keeping August in his eyesight at all times. Alora got to her feet and laid a hand on his side, breathing in his scent. How do you keep him here? August asked, rising with her. Where else does he have to go? Alora asked. August took a step toward Tanglemane, but the horse struck out with his hoof. Alora pushed both of them away and said, He's not used to strangers. He's big, August observed. Not very. But he's very cool, he said. Can I pet him? I don't think he'll like that very much, Alora said. She climbed up on Tanglemane's back. But you can race us. August's mouth dropped. On foot? I'll never win. Ah, oh, come on. Why not? No. August went to walk away, but as he did so, he felt a wet splat upon his head. Green muck fell into his eyes. He parted the plants like a curtain, looking back at the culprit. Alora, who was still on her horse, had thrown a portion of seaweed at him, her face grinning deviously and hands still dripping with reeds. Oh, that is it, August said. He picked up some seaweed and threw it at her, and they began a game. They ran back and forth along the beach, August at a severe disadvantage and being hit over and over with reeds. Alora never got splattered, as Tanglemane moved her quickly out of the way each time August threw. The horse stood still long enough to tease August, but moved just in time to never be hit. Once, August misaimed and hit Tanglemane on the chest. The horse let out a violent snort and ran forward, pushing August into the water with his head. Alora did not rebuke him as she should have, only laughed. Why is it that whenever I am around, you get wet? Alora laughed. August gave her a grumpy look and waded up to the shore. If anyone wanted to get close to you, they'd have to get rid of the horse, August said, wringing out his shirt. Alora nodded, stroking the animal lovingly. No one can touch me when he is around, and every time they do, it's funny to see them try. Alora and August spent almost every day together, from sun up and past sun down, until even Tanglemane had grown somewhat used to the boy's presence, accompanying them on many trips, but not all. On one of the last remaining days of fall, Alora sat on August's porch step, watching the leaves dangle down from the old oak in front of his house. Winter was upon them. With dread, she realized that she would have to stop seeing August and be forced to spend time alone in wolfskin. Damn, Alora, 
August said, throwing down some cards and shaking his head. You're good at this game. Of course I am, Alora said. It was only her fifth or so time playing their modified two-person game of Euchre, but she was managing to smoke August at almost every hand they played. You're unbelievable, he said. If we ever find more people to play with, you're on my team. Little do they know that you're very unpredictable. And you're very predictable, Alora responded. Maybe you just know me well, August teased. Maybe you just get distracted too easily. A wonderful euchre player, and she's a girl. I think I'm in love. August said the words teasingly, but there was something else there as well. Alora didn't answer, unsure of how to feel or how to respond. Alora smirked and said, What do you know about love? Well, what do you know about it? By the silence, it was clear that both parties had decided they were clueless on the subject. August shrugged and added, I think I would want to be friends with a girl before I fell in love. Alora frowned. I wouldn't know. I've never had many friends. Now I'm hurt. August put his hands over his heart. You've got me. And I'm glad for that. She smiled at him. She brushed the hair out of her eyes, contemplating. She didn't like where this was going. It was making her too vulnerable. Before she could stop the words, Alora said, I don't like what happened between your parents. It hurt you. My dad didn't really do anything. My mom just left him, August mumbled. It's so sad. Love should be for a lifetime. Is that what your parents taught you? Alora looked at him and shook her head. No, it is what I know. If Anne Mortals knew anything, it was that they stuck to their mates until life pried them from their cold, clammy hands. It's horrible what my mom did, August said bitterly. Alora looked at him sadly. Don't judge her so harshly. Sometimes things are meant to be that way, and maybe the situation was out of her control. Not everything can be helped. He was silent. August stood up and opened the screen door. I'll see you tomorrow. No, you won't, Alora said with a sigh. August turned around. His voice was horrified. What do you mean? Alora stared out into the distant trees. I go somewhere when winter comes. Where? It's not important, Alora said, but I'll be back next spring. Is it too cold for you during the winter, so you stay with family? August asked. She hated lying to him, but she didn't see another option. Yes. Alora got to her feet and said, Don't be so sad. It's not forever. I like having you around. It's not so lonely here, he complained. The time will go by quickly. You'll see. Winter here lasts forever. Winter won't seem so long this time because you'll be thinking of me. Without hesitation, Alora wrapped her arms around him and he her, so her face was lying against his chest. His warm hold made her feel wanted. They didn't break apart for quite some time. When they did, it was Alora who pulled away, beaming so fully that her happiness reached his eyes. Alora, he started. Why do you have to go away? Stay here with me. I can't do that, August, Alora said. I have obligations. More important obligations than being here. We're good friends. I don't want winter to change that, he said firmly. Time cannot change anything about people who care about each other, she said. But what if it does? He insisted. Worry ran throughout his tone. It can't, August, she said, a touch irritated. You don't know anything. His mouth dropped open in outrage. Are you serious? He shook his head. I thought we were friends. We are friends, Alora said. But the reason I have to leave is important. You wouldn't understand. You won't even tell me where you're going, August said. It's like you don't trust me. She began to feel the itch of wolfskin creeping across her body. I don't have a choice. I have to go. But why? His eyes were begging, pleading. 
It was enough to make Alora want to agree with him, agree to stay. But she knew that her body would not oblige. Her lips trembled as she forced out the words, I just, I can't do what you ask. His head dropped. If you have to go, I want you to know I'm going to miss you. She smiled at him. A sad smile, but a smile nonetheless. I will miss you too, August. Alora. Something lingered on his lips. Something important. Alora thought he might burst with the effort of holding it in. But instead of saying anything, he shook his head and just said, I hope you have fun. Her body relaxed, both with disappointment and relief. See you next spring, Alora said as a final word, and she headed into the darkness of the forest before he could follow her. Chapter 5 Soul of Moon Winter was here. Triumphantly, Alora skipped through the snows, hopping up and down on her paws with the enjoyment of finally being in wolfskin. Being a girl was all right, but it didn't compare with the strong muscles she now possessed, the thrill of how fast she could run, and the great feats she could attempt with her iron jaws. Even better, she could fly. And speaking of flying, Alora gracefully spread her wings and climbed upon the air, making her ascend look effortless as she glided among her kingdom. She blended into the gray clouds and felt magical as she twisted and turned, dipped and dived. She could perform any aerial task without thinking after years and years of practice. The only thing she didn't like about Wolfskin was having to leave August behind. The thought of her friend brought a warmth into her heart that not even the hottest day in summer could gift. He was something new, an interestingly fresh piece in her old game of life. He had a beautiful smile and the best laugh besides. He loved the woods and was a good hunter, too. He could talk to her about anything. That showed that he trusted her. Alora knew that if it was allowed, she could tell him anything, too, and he would keep it to himself. They were close friends, and with Alora never having a friend— she thought that their friendship was something to be valued more than the most precious gem. Alora brushed through the ether of clouds without thought. She was hungry, so she gazed down through the pines. Nothing so far. A flock of birds were flapping their way through the skies, not too far from where she was. Alora diverted her course and headed toward them at super speed, tucking her wings in closer and zooming toward the giant gang of fowl. Twittering rained as Alora opened her mouth. A small bird flew inside, unable to swerve in time. She crunched its bones cheerfully and swallowed the thing whole, looking for another and another, until her belly was full and the flock was in a total riot. Alora let the rest of them go, enjoying their frantic tweeting. They were radiant creatures, too, but she had to eat, and they were tastier than they were pretty. Her mind swirled with the gore of it all, how her mouth felt when the muscle was running thick past her tongue, and the blood was staining her muzzle red. She licked her lips with the pleasure of bringing down her prey fresh. Once Alora was satisfied, she decided to take an early morning's cruise along the treetops. Breezing her way past high-peaked cliffs and frozen waterfalls, Alora noticed a blank white canvas below her, a gorgeous plot of land that struck a chord in her memory. Interested, she descended to have a look around. Alora landed right in the middle, the puzzle in her brain connecting with her eyes. She had been here before. This was the plain where the tribal people had once lived. It had been a decently sized village, but there were none of them left now. The Pale Ones had chased them out long ago. Alora knew that if the ground wasn't frozen like rock— she could dig and find many arrowheads, old basket pieces, and other artifacts. Some of those things might even have been her own. Alora had stayed with the tribe for a long time, nearly a hundred years. She had even met Tanglemane here a couple years before the fur traders had finally decided to make war against the tribe. He had been given to her as a gift by the chief, the first horse they had ever found. 
She had trained him herself. Within a few years, he had become immortal too, chained to Alora's and mortality by the fact she had no mate to protect her, so he became her protector himself. The people here had loved Alora. She had come to them in a blizzard in wolfskin, curious at the noise they were making on their drums. Braves had been sent out to kill her, but once they had seen her great wings, they had led her back to the leader. He and his council had declared her a spirit sent by their ancestors, and they allowed her to venture into their wigwams and spend the long winter with them. Once she had become a young girl again, she trusted them enough to reveal her and mortality. It was a thing she'd never done with the Pale Ones. Those humans destroyed nearly everything they touched. Alora knew she had watched. Alora remembered the happy play of the children, the beautiful craftsmanship of the women, and the strong hearts of the men. She never grew close enough to anyone to call them a friend, but they believed she was theirs. She protected the tribe. For many years there was peace. It was a time of prosperity and celebration. Then fire had come, and after that there was a war with a fellow tribe, and by the time the Pale Ones arrived, there wasn't much left for the surviving group to do but die out. So Alora moved on. For centuries after, even now, Alora wondered why she had spent such a long period of her life with the tribe. And mortals didn't need the constant companionship of a group. Like most and mortals, Alora was happiest on her own. Agathi would call her odd for living with the tribe, but her mother would say that Alora had gone through a common phase. Except for her short rebellion with the natives, Alora had followed every tradition of an Anne mortal her entire life, right down to the adoration of freedom, and she liked it that way. Or maybe she was simply trying to convince herself of that. In front of her very eyes, the tribesmen rose out of the ground and formulated into snow people— dancing and skipping around her in circles and chanting a hunting song. Her tongue lolling out of the biggest dog grin she had worn in years, Alora began dancing with them, each touch of her paw landing with the pounding of the drums, each sweeping wing skimming the ground in time with the bells tied to the outfits of the dancers. She powwowed with the swirling tribe until the wind brushed them back to the icy ground and she herself could barely stand for breathing. What a rush! She had forgotten how the people could dance. Alora didn't like admitting it, but she knew that the short decades she had spent with them had been some of the best years of her life. To admit that she had a life was a miracle to her. Time had a way of not being real when you lived forever. Reminiscing a bit sorrowfully now, Alora trotted away to take flight again. What was she thinking? Time wasn't real. It was just the change of things that made it seem like it was. August is trapped by time, she thought. Trapped in a mortal body. Eventually he'll die, but I won't. Her stomach felt an unfamiliar pang. What a strange thought. August dying. And she... And mortal. Alora sailed under the crescent moon, letting her paws drift through the crisp midnight air. She hovered over August's house for a while, circling it like a vulture until she was sure that he was safe and warm inside his cabin. She checked up on him daily now, looking in every so often and wondering what he was doing. It was wrong to stalk him, she knew, but she did it anyway. Alora always did what she wanted, right or wrong. So the days continued. She hunted, she ate, she slept. She watched the snowflakes drift down, enjoyed the frolicking cheerfulness of rabbits playing in the drifts, and made it a habit to check on the phases of the moon every night. The weather and the forest itself was a painting she never got tired of, so she waited patiently for spring between strange hours, making puffs of mist with her breath for entertainment. Through all this content calm was a slightly uncomfortable pinprick in her brain. It was a nagging, tiny thought in the back of her head that she barely ever acknowledged. Despite her ignoring the problem, it didn't go away. It took her a week, but she finally figured out what it was. There was no one around. She had no mate to wander with, no kindred soul to accompany her in her footsteps. 
Tanglemane was wandering, and she couldn't have fun with August in this body. She didn't even have the company of the forest creatures, as they all avoided her as much as possible. As far as she knew, there weren't any Anmortals for hundreds of miles. As small and reluctant to admit it as anything, Alora wished she could catch a glimpse of at least one person. She had never wanted this before, and had always been content with only herself for companionship, but now she felt very alone. Alora looked around for any sign of a friend, but there were none to be found. Something had changed in her since she had befriended August, and she did not like it. One night, Alora flew off her perch in an oak tree and drifted to the ground, putting her paws through the ice patches to try and eliminate the silence. Her head wavered back and forth, looking for life, for something other than herself that she could put her attention on. Alora let out a lone, inquisitive call, but nobody answered. It was the second month after the first night of wolfskin. Alora padded along, her paws grazing along the top of the snowbanks as if she floated instead of ran. It was the most radiant evening. The clouds had parted, leaving a small pink glow of sun to kiss the land, while snowflakes bigger than her ears did a pirouette gently to the earth. You could hear the relaxing sound of it hitting the earth. It coated everything in such a glorious way that if Alora imagined the afterlife, she would think it looked like this. It was deadly, though. It was the beauty of sadness, Winter, and Alora knew if she stayed in it too long, even with her thick coat of fur, she would freeze. She was heading back to her den now, but first needed a quick drink. She came to the stream but found it frozen. A bit discouraged, she turned to leave, but before she could, she found herself gazing at her muddled reflection in the clear ice. What a lovely creature she was! That lengthy jawline, the perfect refinement of each and every part of her face, eyes, and ears. Her legs were long and lovely, her body thin but still muscular. Her white fur was cleaner than the very snow, and those large, vibrant wings she carried were full of those plush, shiny feathers. If you could touch them, you would reason that they were the softest things in the world. As she was praising herself, a single horrible thought crept into her mind. What if she was the only and mortal left? Alora sniffed, drawing her head away from the water. How could I doubt that I am alone? My kind is so brilliant, it's impossible that we could all be gone. What could kill us? The other and mortals are wise enough to keep themselves alive. I know I am. The rest of them are still here. I'm certain. Over here, a voice cried out to her. Alora paused in her tracks, looking toward the sky. The voice had come from above, and she had not heard it before. Who had spoken it? Thinking she was hearing something on the wind, Alora continued on her way. The voice said again, Over here, Alora. It's me. Me who? Alora demanded, feeling irritated. Who are you? I am the last, Alora, the voice cried. I am the last and mortal there is. Don't be ridiculous, she snapped, angry that there was an invader on her turf. I'm an immortal, and I doubt that you could be one, playing such a stupid, childish trick on me. Who are you, and why are you here? Find me, Alora, the voice yelled. Alora looked skyward and saw that up above, hovering in the air, was a wolf just like her. She was pure white, too, with great swan wings. The other wolf cocked her head and said, Come to me, Alora. Come find me. An emotion flooded her so deeply that she hardly recognized it. Relief. She would have normally been jealous with another wolf to rival her, but the occasion didn't call for it. She was so glad that she wasn't alone in the world that she rose up in flight, blowing away snow with the force of her updraft. There you are. So you don't lie. You really are an mortal. Have you heard anything from any of our kind? The others, I mean. Do you know my parents or my brother? Have you seen them? Where are you, Alora? 
Where are you? I can't see you, the white wolf said again, swishing her head back and forth. I'm here, I'm here, Alora cried, charging forward. The other wolf cried, Alora, and took off flying in the other direction, soaring as fast as her wings would go. Alora barked and followed her, dodging between trees as she continued her chase. The other Anmortal was quick, the fastest thing she had ever seen fly. Alora beat her wings against the wind and tried to keep up, but the heavily falling snow was making it difficult to see anything but the other Anmortal's tail. Alora! The other wolf yelled again, panicked. She was scared now. Alora shouted, I'm here! But didn't look where she was going. Her left paw caught on something, and she was ripped out of the air, sent spiraling down to the ground, and slamming into an embankment of snow. Stunned, Alora called out to the other Anne Mortal, but she was gone. She must have flown out of hearing and out of sight. Feeling very foolish, Alora turned on her side and looked up, trying to remember when the last time was that she had tripped. Never. As a rule, Anne Mortals did not stumble, and certainly not out of the air. It was a broken white wood. At any other given time she would have seen it there, but in her haste she was oblivious. The top had been ripped off, and that's what she had caught her paw on. Alora flew back up and studied it. It looked like something had broken the tree in half, though she didn't think it was the weather. Alora shook her head and left the mystery, searching for the other and mortal. She flew around and around the forest, retracing her steps, but she found nothing that indicated the other and mortal had even existed at all. Alora came to one conclusion. Either she was seeing things, or something in the woods was playing tricks on her. Within a few days, Alora decided that something was different in the forest. More strange occurrences were popping up, such as newly broken trees and sand dunes that slumped oddly to one side. One day, Alora stumbled yet again and found herself lying in a massive footprint, a track that was bigger than she was. Whoever had been here had tried to make their appearance obvious, as shown by all the traces they were leaving behind. Alora wasn't afraid. She was an mortal, wasn't she? She was sure all these things were just figments of her imagination, a manifestation of her loneliness. If not, then why wasn't the thing who had made the signs brave enough to come and face her? Obviously, it was scared. She was invincible, the greatest thing that had ever happened to these woods. Anything that came, she could fight it and chase out. Even humans, who were dangerous to themselves, were no real danger to her. She just needed to keep out of their sight. The thought of an unknown stranger lurking in the shadows didn't make her shiver. Alora slept soundly each night. No matter who the visitor in the woods was, they certainly posed no threat to her. Or so she believed. Winter came and went, and with the arrival of her girl body, Alora rose up from a bed of new flowers, a thrill in her veins. The cold months were over. She could see August again. Chapter 6 Soul of Sun Days later, August greeted her again on the shoreline. He eagerly trounced to her side and exclaimed, Alora, hi, guess what I found out? Two guys our age, Todd and Dustin, have moved in next door. We have more people to hang out with. Isn't that great? Alora forced a smile, though the fact that new humans were moving in close by made her nervous. I only want to spend time with you, August. I don't care about getting to know anyone else. The boy turned red as Alora stared at him curiously. She didn't understand why August was so shy. And mortals rarely showed themselves to humans, and she herself was genuinely interested in him. He hadn't been so bashful when she had left him on his porch last year. The two friends walked along the beach. August shivered, but Alora's bare feet touched the freezing cold water without a care. You go without shoes a lot, he stated. You've just noticed this now? Alora laughed. His cheeks once again blushed pink. No, it's just... I'm paying more attention, if you know what I mean. Alora didn't catch his meaning, 
She chuckled and said, I never wear shoes. They're not comfortable to me. You're so weird, he said, laughing. Alora skipped and said, Come with me. I want to show you my house. It's only fair since you showed me yours. Alora took his hand and pulled him into the brush, winding through pines until they came to a hollow tree with thorn bushes around it. She led him through the branches, easily slipping through the thorns herself while August became scratched and tangled. She gave his hand a final tug. He found himself in a small room with thick pelts on the floor, dresses hanging on a handmade rope, and a black fire pit below a hole in the tree. It was very clean and had nothing else inside except her bow and its quiver of arrows. Wow, he breathed. You live like this? If you say so, she shrugged. Alora already regretted bringing him here. For the first time since she was a child, she felt vulnerable. Not even Tanglemane had been inside here before, and the look on August's face was more horrified than impressed. As if this wasn't normal. This is real, right? You're not pulling my leg? August's tone was almost pleading, begging her to say this was a joke. No? Is there a problem? Alora said sharply, now annoyed. She tapped her fingers on her arm and waited for his response. Alora, August said, and he moved uncomfortably. I'm your friend, and I care about you. I've got to say this. You shouldn't have to live in these conditions. What's wrong with the way I live? Alora asked, insulted. He frowned. It's primitive. You can't stay in a home like this. This is the way my people have lived for thousands of years. Why should I live any differently? She responded. Now I know why you have to move in the winter. You wouldn't survive in this place, August said. This is my home. I've lived here longer than I can remember, she insisted. You've probably never gone to a real school, have you? He asked. You're basically homeless. Is this where your parents raised you? Are they even around? Why is it your concern? She snapped. He was a stupid human. He didn't understand. Alora, you should have electricity, running water, a heater. Do you even have a bathroom in here? Does it matter? Alora said. For your parents to raise you like this is practically abuse. August shook his head. My parents were wonderful. How can you be this way? Just because I live in a different way from you. Her eyes flashed with fury. I just want you to be safe. He came and placed his hands on her shoulders. And this isn't. I want you to come live with me. Alora's whole world funneled into a spiral. Live with August? Dwell in his home day after day and never have to leave. Be the first person he saw in the morning and the last one he saw at night. It would be bliss. But Alora saw a wolf pelt on the floor, and she knew it wouldn't last long. The change would come with the first of winter, and what would she do then? Come back next spring and say she had run away? No, she said simply, leaving no room for argument. Alora was playful, but she was also stubborn. No matter how badly she wanted to accept August's offer, there was too much to risk. But his voice was quashed as the look on her face went from concrete to fire. A rough voice echoed in the forest. August looked out the door and said, Dad needs my help with something. I have to go. Just think about what I said, okay? Her throat seized up. She did not answer. He left meekly while Alora sank to the floor and immersed herself in her furs. That night, Alora twitched and tossed in her sleep, cringing against Tanglemane's belly as he nickered to try and wake her up. In her nightmare, Alora was in wolfskin, and she panted with wide eyes as she ran back and forth among the leafless trees that toppled mercilessly behind her, ablaze with a fire that it would take the very lake to put out. The snow she was bolting through was deeper than the lake, and she dashed through it as it began to crumble into a deep, gaping red hole that was consuming the entire world. Alora looked behind her and tripped over her own paws, backing away from the chasm with her tail tucked between her legs. 
A large monster cranked up from the bottom, red smoke furling out of its metal mouth. It was made of copper and in the shape of a man, but it was the size of a mountain. It consumed everything in its sight and reached for her with its long metal fingers. The fingers turned into chains as the monster grew closer. It had two chasm-like, unfathomable black eyes, one in the middle of its forehead and the other just below where the bridge of the nose was supposed to be. The eyes seemed to torture her just by looking at her. The chains clanked and wrapped around Alora, pulling her into the abyss. In the dream she howled. In the real world, she screamed. Alora stayed hidden from August for a week after that. She rode on Tanglemane's back and watched him through the trees as he roamed around with the new boys, Todd and Dustin. Alora knew he missed her, but she needed to give herself time after what had happened in her hut. Still, Alora had to struggle with herself not to jump out and grab August to prevent him from further stupidity that was a result of his new friends. The more she observed the new boys, the more she found things to dislike. Todd was large, tan-skinned, with brutish features, a caveman in all rights, and perhaps three times as slow. Dustin reminded her of a wiry fox, with his toothy grin and wispy form, his poisonous words that were coated in syrup. Alora didn't like humans in general, except for August, but these humans she particularly disliked. They were brash and dim-witted, leaving trash on the beaches and carelessly shooting anything that moved. Alora heard their shouts from her forest as they madly destroyed things, whether it be the boat they found that wasn't theirs, or burning down the cabin that had been someone's vacation home, just to get a laugh. They were loud. There was a type of loud Alora enjoyed, a cheerful, bright sound that her brother had often exhibited. But Todd and Dustin were not it. They were a rude loud. Though she had denied it at first, August was becoming more and more like them every day, becoming crude and destructive, reckless. It pained her to see him change so easily. It was only a matter of time before she could no longer avoid him. One blood-red sunset, she couldn't take it anymore, and decided that she needed to confront August. The boys had slaughtered a rabbit unnecessarily, shooting the creature and leaving it there to bleed. Alora scrutinized the evidence carefully. They did not use the fur or the meat, so why had they killed it? She shook her head at the waist. Man had such blatant disregard for life, so much that they even killed their own. She did not understand it. A little later, August came back as she knew he would. He saw her kneeling by the dead creature and put his head down in embarrassment, clutching a shovel. Why did you kill it? she asked, emotion vacant from her voice. He cleared his throat. Todd thought it would be funny to watch it die. So do you get joy from death? she asked. No, he said, horrified. It's just a rabbit. His tone implied that she should get over it. She looked at his shovel and said, Don't bury it. The beast will need to eat tonight. And like you said... Her voice turned steely, rough, and cold. It's just a rabbit. The next week, August was sitting on a rock, watching the sun come up over the lake to start the new day. The Anne Mortal came up behind him, taking her place on the stone by his side. It was amazing how he could know she was there without ever seeing. August sighed and said, Alora, I know you're thinking I'm being a jerk lately. Perhaps? She looked out at the lake, able to see him, know him, without ever looking at his face. But I'm serious about my offer. Please come live with me. It's the right thing to do. I don't like the idea of you sleeping there all by yourself every night. My people have done it for centuries. You can't convince me otherwise, she said, and that was the end of it. The sound of their talking was the waves, their friendship the sound of the breeze rustling through the trees. Alora turned her head to look at him, and he her, and Alora's stomach fluttered while her heart leapt up in her chest. Beautiful, isn't it? he asked, referring to the sky but talking directly to her. 
His eyes were warm, deep, and gentle. She could just melt into them. While looking into them, she forgot her anger. She took his hands in hers and whispered in his ear, I know of a place more beautiful. Close your eyes and come with me. He did as Alora told him. She led him down boulders and through plains, tossing aside branches and climbing over bushes, avoiding dawn light as she led him to their destination. Alora let go of his hands and backed away. Open your eyes, she instructed. August did, and he gasped. Crystal starlight cascaded down from a great height and splashed into a soft pool below, not murky and threatening like the pond they had nearly drowned in before, but peaceful and welcoming. Trees stretched out above the waterfall in great heights and made a tinkling noise as thousands of vegetable and soda cans on strings clinked together. The sun made the tin reflect rainbows. I saw you and your father throw them away. They make wonderful music, and I've been collecting them for years, she explained. August was open-mouthed with awe. She motioned to the water with her head, dipping her foot into the pool. August pulled off his clothes until he was standing in plain blue boxers. She kept her own dress on and led him into the liquid mirror. The pool was warm from the light and gentle to touch. The Anmortal and the boy moved circles around each other, swimming in unison and never letting their eyes leave each other. Alora pulled August through the waterfall, sitting on the rock underneath and letting their feet hang in the small cavern. The water curtain fell fast while tiny fish swam underneath. How'd you find this place? August asked, his voice still tinged with amazement. It was one of my father's favorites. He found this for my mother. I didn't think things like this existed, except in fairy tales. Of course they do. You just have to be willing to find them. Alora kicked her legs in the water. August watched, saying softly, Does this mean we're friends again? Alora froze. Whatever made you think we weren't? You've been mad at me lately for trying to force you to move in, he mumbled. Yes, but that's not a reason to stop speaking to you, Alora asked. August shrugged. She moved closer to him and said, If you're looking for an answer, yes, of course. We're best friends. Alora's hair hung in front of her face. August brushed it away and she looked at him strangely. She couldn't remember a time when someone had done that before. Without a second thought, she grabbed him. They went back into the deep water and underneath the fall. Without thinking, she entwined her hands in his hair while submerged and pressed her wild, magical lips to his. His eyes widened at first, but he crumbled after a moment and let her kiss him as she wanted. This was better than warmth and sweeter than death, sharper than feeling. It had more recklessness in it than a wolf with first blood. He tasted like fresh new life and vibrancy, inexperienced rawness mixing with her years of experience. He was so innocent. He knew nothing of the world, knew little about what it could do. He had not seen all the days she had, all the pain she'd faced, and her kiss was like taking the very youth from him and making it her own. For the first time in her life, Alora wished she could be like him, a fresh new canvas, human and mortal, instead of this empty shell that held on and on and on. She didn't pull back until she needed air, and when she did, she pushed August away from her as if electrocuted by his touch, swimming up and onto land with impossible speed. When she came upon the grass, she felt the eyes of the forest drilling into her. It knew what she had done. Before August had even thought of coming up after her, she was flitting through the trees and far away. She felt so stretched, so ancient. And mortals couldn't die of old age, but they could be killed, and they could lose their immortality if they chose to love something other than another and mortal. Alora told herself she was only playing, that she couldn't love the human boy. She was a part of earth and sun and sky, as much a part of time as she was in the past and would be years and years from now. Man would become a shadow, and centuries would ebb, but the feel of the grass under her feet would always be the same. 
August would fade and wither away like a summer goldenrod, and she would watch him as he grew into a wise elder. And then he would die. She would think about him when all the others had forgotten his name, but she would still be her own and be free. At least, that is the lie that she told herself. Chapter 7 Spotlight Eyes The summer grew long and stretched like butter on bread. The animals grew wary of Alora's fondness for August. Thoughts of betrayal were born, and as the leaves began to turn, everyone in the woods knew there would soon come a day when the land's suspicion about Alora would be sealed, and there would be no reconciliation. August shouldn't have been wandering alone at night. Under the glare of the full moon, he stepped right into a mother's den. There were dozens of coyotes on him in a second, and the beasts wasted no time to attack. They tore into his clothes with claw and sharp teeth, digging their fangs deeply into his skin until it shred and bled. He punched one in the nose to try and scrabble away, but the dark made him trip and stumble. The more he fought off, the more beasts that jumped upon him. The coyotes were going for the throat, until there was a wild scream, and their ears perked up in fear. Alora leapt into the air over a log, her throat crying out a wretched, maddening sound. She landed on several coyotes. She grabbed them, slamming them against the forest floor and rubbing them into the dirt. Alora had forgotten she wasn't in wolfskin. She growled like a creature as she whipped the animals one by one into one another. Tanglemane wasn't too far behind. He came and stomped his hooves loudly, gathering dust into the night air and scattering the group. August caught his bearings and ran. He didn't look back as he tore through the trees as fast as his legs could carry him. Later on, he would assume that some sort of bear had charged the group when he was being attacked. He would figure that the terrible scream and harsh fighting must have come from some sort of crazed animal, not from Alora. When the fight was finished, fresh blood ran on the ground, dripping from Alora's face. One of the coyotes had been crushed. His friends gathered around him, whimpering with tails tucked between their legs. They howled before silently slinking away. Their eyes seemed to say, We were only protecting ourselves. See what it costs to love the mortal boy? Tanglemane swished his tail and turned away, trotting back into the thick fog of night. He cared nothing for their misery. Alora's desire had been to protect August, and whatever Alora wanted, Tanglemane fought for. Alora, however, was different. She was an mortal and therefore could not cry, so she simply dug a hole for the dead coyote with her hands and buried him. She gathered flowers to scatter around his grave. Although it was a beautiful act, she knew it could never resolve what she had done. Before, if she had killed, it had merely been the cycle of life. She felt no regret, but this was different. She could have made sure August had gotten away without causing any harm— the boy had been long on the run before the male had been killed. She didn't do it for food or out of fear, or even to defend August. She killed him out of revenge, revenge that the stupid canine had ever thought that he could touch her beloved August. Already, it seemed like a part of her mortality was missing. She tried to shrug it off, to banish the feeling as if it were only an annoyance. For nights afterward, though, rest didn't come. Alora no longer felt totally free. For some reason now, a small part of her seemed trapped. One starlit night, August and Alora walked along the beach together, hands brushing but not yet grasping. Alora had managed to snatch August's jacket from him and was wearing it, playing up her part of the playful girl by leaning against him. Being an mortal, she didn't get cold but the garment felt nice against her shoulders. The smell that came off of it, though, August's smell, was better. The waves made a crashing sound as their feet touched the cold lake. Alora, August said, and he grabbed her hand. She looked at him with large, round eyes. August took a deep breath and said, 
I'm going back to my mother's for a few weeks, even though I don't want to. I've tried to get out of it, but my dad is making me go. I'm... I'm scared that if I go back alone, I'll lose myself, and I won't come back. His voice wavered. You know how I act when I talk about her. I don't want to be that person anymore, and you help me not to be. Will you come with me? Alora looked away from him at the moon and the waves. She wished to go with August, but she didn't want to leave her home either. She'd never left the sanctuary of the lakes. When will you be back? Two days before October. It was cutting it close. If the snow fell before she got back, she would return to Wolfskin with August around. And what would happen then? I'm not sure, August. Give me the night to think it over. She shrugged off the jacket and handed it back to him. It would mean the world to me. Oh, I know, Alora said, remembering how August's mother had acted when she still resided in the woods. Don't feel like you have to. If you can't, I'll ask Todd or Dustin. You won't have to do that, Alora rushed. He gave her a quizzical look, and she said, Well, at least I don't think so. The dumb human had made her flounder, her, an Anne mortal. August chuckled and shook off his jacket, putting it on with a smile. He thought he had won now, had he? Well, she would show him. If you want me to come with you so badly, why don't you just tell me why? She prodded, nodding her head. August blushed in the moonlight and looked away. I, uh, you're my friend. I think we're a little more than that. Alora leaned in to give him a small peck on the cheek. Even though her lips longed for a lengthy, beautiful kiss, she knew she shouldn't push too far. The place where she had kissed burned red hot. August cleared his throat, said, Oh, why not? He then swept her into his arms to give her a deep kiss. Alora enjoyed it, savoring the sweetness. Alora pulled away and ruffled his hair a bit with her fingers, saying, Well, that was fine, she said, suppressing a laugh as his face became stricken. But now that you've shown me, why don't you tell me? After his last spectacular performance, August wasted no time in letting all the words rush out. I'm going to be honest with you, Alora. You make me feel alive. It's like, when I'm with you, my veins are on fire, and I just feel like I have all this power that isn't normal. Or maybe it is normal, and the rest of me isn't. I can do anything as long as I'm with you. Alora grabbed his hand instinctively, for this was how it felt to be an mortal. And only a human who truly loved an an mortal could feel how she could— Oh, all right, August. I'll come with you to your mother's. But we must be back before winter. Do you promise that? August clenched her hand tighter. Before the first snowfall. If such a thing were possible, Alora could have sworn August read her mind. Before their very eyes, the sky caught fire. Blue, pink, green, and gold all laced through the air, creating a show that captivated even Alora who had seen such things a million times, yet never grew tired of watching. The Northern Lights, August said, staring up in appreciation. They're so beautiful. It is a legend in my culture that when we die, the souls of my people fly upward to join with the sanctifier and make the lights, Alora said, pointing to the Aurora Borealis. Each soul shines a different color, they all come together to create a dance that never ends. What is the sanctifier? August asked, curious. He is the maker of everything, Alora said. She looked at the lights and her eyes seemed to shine. Sometimes I wonder if, if my family is up there. They're not dead, August said. But I thought you said they were. I never said they died, only that they left. That's terrible. They just abandoned you? It's the way of my people. When we are grown, the parents leave and the siblings separate. I haven't seen them since I turned sixteen. I wish I knew what happened to them. She dropped her head. She'd turned sixteen millennia ago. But I'm sure they must be dead. August put his arm around her shoulder. I believe they're up there, Alora, August said. And they're shining beautifully for you tonight. Alora smiled at him. 
As long as you never leave me, August, then I think I would become a light. I will never leave. That is a promise, he said, giving her another kiss. That same night, in the darkest hour just before the dawn, Alora traveled through the dark woods alone. She made way for her sleeping place, and the cold wind crawled over her skin as if it were a warning. Alora paused in her footsteps and shivered. Heavy footsteps crunched in the leaves behind her, and she turned slowly, with precision. Her fears were realized as she stared into that frightening face. The windcomer, the kidnapper of Anne Mortals. His sharp, biting smell was the scent of rusting metal, for that was what he was. A copper beast, mixed with parts of iron, silver, and Alora knew not what else. There was nothing on him that was truly living. Every part he possessed was made of metal. He had a flat, reptilian face, with crunching iron jaws that could consume multiple deer in one sitting. His body was one of some twisted lizard. When he moved closer to her, he wiggled back and forth as if squirming through the dirt. His legs were squat and close to the ground, with flat feet that had copper claws at the end. Every part of him was large, but the most prominent was his stomach. That part of him bulged out, as if he spent his entire lifetime eating. His swayed back ended at a tail made of long chains that dragged against the ground. There was rust and seaweed all over him, the wetness from the lake seeping down into the leaves. He dragged himself ahead of her. The sound he made as he did so was so loud that she wanted to cover her ears, the screeching noise of metal grinding against metal. He seemed to be a mountain, and if Alora was to jump down from his back, it would be very likely she would break her legs from the drop. It wasn't his size or his form, however, that was the most frightening. The windcomer had large, gaping glass eyes, that were the exact shape of spotlights in the front of his head. The eyes shone, too, and wherever the windcomer would look, light would be cast like two great overcharged lights sweeping the land. They had no pupils or color. It was like looking directly into the center of a lamp. "'You've come for me, then,' Alora said. She prepared to be swallowed. The copper machine opened his mouth. When he spoke— his voice was one of old chains rattling against walls, spine-tingling, raspy, and cold. Not yet. Alora stood silently. This was never part of the tales. Look at me, he said, and Alora's eyes snapped to his face. I roam the world century after century, looking for your kind and eating them one by one. It has grown rather boring. I am tired of this gameplay. I want more. Alora didn't speak. So he had known her before, then, had been watching her all along. Now the giant footprints and wrecked trees made sense. He came closer to her. Alora was smart enough not to move. You are going to have to play by the rules I set, child. It is not the law that you live by that you will now obey. It is mine. Her voice shook with terror and shock. Your rule? I have planned for some time to swallow you whole. But I've been watching you, and I've grown fonder and fonder of you. Your beauty, your arrogance. You are a true and mortal, something I haven't tasted since the dawn of time. Such a delicacy should be saved for last. But why would you bother to wait that long— I was in your grasp, she whispered. I prefer my prey to give itself up willingly. The taste is bitter if I have hunted down that which I crave by sheer force. The windcomer let out a loud, menacing laugh. He moved his tail to touch her chin. She turned her head away in fright. The machine creaked, dissatisfied. Have it your way. It's better to watch you choose your own doom. I have seen the human boy, watched you together, and I know that you love him. I will tell you this. You have a month longer, until the snow falls, to make a choice. You can be taken by me and become my prisoner, 
your freedom will be lost, and yet you will still be immortal. Or you can choose to give up your immortality and be free to love the human all your life until you die an old woman. Alora looked away. You're not sure which is worse? The windcomer asked. I will tell you what is worse. To live alone forever, the last of your kind. To drift in and out of these worlds and see the things you love leave as you continue on. For there will never be another. Oh yes, they are all gone, he said, noticing the panicked look on her face. I have taken them all or they have chosen to take mortality and die. Now it is your turn. Alora could not speak. The windcomer stared at her with his calm, emotionless eyes. You are the last of the immortals. Let the line end with you. The world no longer needs your kind. Love the human boy and do not return, just as your horse will never return. Her eyes widened, Tanglemane, what have you done with Tanglemane? With a hideous smile on his face, the windcomer said, I did nothing, my dear. He was a part of you. But he feels neglected now that the human boy is in your heart. He ran from you and will never return. Alora screamed. All thought forgotten, she ran away from the windcomer. For the first time in his existence, he let an anmortal escape but never out of his sight. As the windcomer drifted into the shadows of the forest, Alora shouted for Tanglemane. She looked everywhere, in every place she knew, but she didn't find him. In the clouds above, the windcomer looked on. She called and called, but Tanglemane never came back. Chapter 8 The Greater Water Come on, Alora, we're going to be late for the plane, August called cheerfully. Alora didn't smile back as they walked through the airplane terminal. She felt uncomfortable in the modern clothes August had bought for her. The denim pants bit into her skin, and the shirts were just as tight, but that couldn't be helped. The suitcase he had packed for her was probably full of the same things, and if she wanted to fit into his world, she had to wear them. The shoes were the worst— constricting her feet and making them itch. The only thing she enjoyed wearing was a deerskin jacket August had grown out of. The windcomer's demands kept pressing into her mind. They did not leave her by day or by night, rampaging through her daydreams and nightmares. Choose her and mortality, or choose August. If it wasn't the windcomer, it was her grief over Tanglemane a deep aching in her heart that wouldn't leave, as if some invisible force was taking a stone and bashing it into her chest over and over. If it had been possible for her to cry, there was no doubt to her that she would endlessly sob for her beloved. She wondered where he was now. Had he found someone else to care for? Someone mortal? He would be mortal now, too. Eventually die. Her heart clenched. Yet he was gone, so Alora didn't know what else to do but move on. The only thing that worked to ease her hurt was looking at August, knowing he was there and nearby, listening to the balm, the medicine in his voice. All Alora wanted was to forget about the choice she had to make, the decision that was drawing closer with each minute. The best way for her to do that was to make sure August never left her side. Being in the vicinity of all these people was making her nervous. She had shied at meeting his father. When they had stopped to eat, she had been unable to. She disliked the human food she had been served, and was glad she'd managed to pack her own in the suitcase when August wasn't looking. August had told her it was a very small airport, only three planes. Still, it was more people than Alora had ever seen in her life— the only animals she saw there were small dogs on leashes. To her, it was all horribly backwards. The car ride to the airport was the only thing about the human world that hadn't made her jumpy. August had driven them both, so that had made her feel safe. It was painful, however, as the blurring of the scenery and the jolting of the vehicle reminded her of riding on Tanglemane. You can leave your bags here, 
August told her as they came to a moving conveyor. The workers will take care of them. Alora warily laid her possessions on the belt and watched them drift away slowly. As they boarded the plane, Alora felt trapped by the small walls around her. She sighed when they finally entered the vehicle. She tried to ignore that the plane was made of metal, though her stomach still twisted with sickness. This felt terribly like being trapped in the windcomer's belly. August snapped in, and she asked, Is a plane like a car, only faster? August shook his head. A plane goes up in the air. It flies. Flies? She said. Excitement coursed through her. Alora hadn't flown in months. Would the plane sprout great feathery wings from its side and take off, bobbing up and down with the effort of lifting itself into the air? Her question was answered when the plane gathered more and more speed, and just like when she ran and leapt into the air in wolfskin, the plane simply left the ground. For the first time in days, Alora let out a laugh of exhilaration. Several passengers glanced at her in alarm. August beamed as she pressed her nose to the window, watching the ground drift farther and farther away. The world's troubles left her, and she felt as if the windcomer couldn't possibly reach her up here. There's the town, August pointed. Alora looked back through her window to see the little buildings and cars. They were all so tiny now. Beyond that was her forest, the tall pines and great lakes. Alora felt a pang of homesickness already, but did something that even surprised herself. She looked away. They came to a place August called Florida a few hours later. Alora was disappointed to get off the plane, yet eager to see what this new land had in store for her. Outside her window, there were a lot of buildings and much sunshine. The trees were different here. It looked like an alien world. August had developed a headache from the air pressure. She led them off the plane and to the nearest conveyor, where they got their bags. August rubbed his temples and complained, I hate flying. In this terminal, there were even more people. Alora fidgeted, glancing around at all the hundreds of faces, her mouth going quite dry. August grabbed her hand and said, Hey, take it easy. I know, I don't like crowds either. There won't be any once we get in the taxi. But first, let's have some dinner. By the time they had gotten their bags, Alora's stomach was growling. The places around her didn't serve deer meat, but she made do with the small salad of greens. August plowed into his food like a bear. Was there any amount of food he wouldn't inhale? It was around sunset when they got into a car that a strange man was driving. Although Alora wasn't afraid of him, she still pressed close to August on the back seat while she looked at her surroundings. What a strange place! Where was all the open space, the smell of fresh air and sweet pine? She saw a few bushes sparked with large pink flowers and trees that August called palm trees. Strange slabs of rock grew in perfect straight lines that people walked upon, and the roads weren't gravel here. They passed buildings that were taller than the highest trees in the forest. It was all so strange. She'd never known such a place could exist. Here we are, August said as they pulled up to a small white house in a crowded village. He opened the car door for her and helped her out as she looked around. The weather was far too hot here. The sun nearly fried her soft skin. Where's the lake? she asked, turning to August in confusion. We don't have a lake here, August said. We have an ocean instead. What was an ocean? August paid the driver and brought out their bags, going to the front door. Alora followed. August knocked on the door three times in a soft manner before a woman came to answer. She was the same woman Alora had seen years before, except her dark hair was graying, and she wore much fancier clothes. She grimaced and said, You're late. Didn't want to leave the boonies so soon. Alora looked around, wondering whom she was talking to and what it was about. August bit his lip and said, It wasn't us, Mother. The plane ran late. I should expect so, from such low-quality airfare. Your father is so cheap, the woman sniffed. Her gaze pivoted on Alora, and she brightened. Ah, and who is your new lady friend? It's Alora, Mom. 
August reddened. I met her last spring. I told you she was coming. August's mom looked her up and down and said, Finally, one of your friends I actually like. Come in, girl, and August will show you to your room. Once inside, Alora looked around. The place was filled with expensive and breakable things. Alora wondered how much the woman actually lived in the house. There was no dirt on the wooden floor, nor on the pelts that were covered in designs of flowers. Alora wondered why you would put such pretty pelts on the floor if you weren't going to walk on them. You'll stay in the room on the second floor, right next to mine, August said. They climbed up the stairs, being careful not to scuff them, while Alora tried not to notice the woman staring into her back. Alora had decided that the way August's mother looked at her was the same way the windcomer looked at her, like she was something to eat. It's small, but I'm sure you won't mind, August said as he pushed open the door. The bedroom was average to any human, with a double-sized bed and a dresser, but to Alora, it looked like a queen's palace. She bolted to the window and said, Look, you can see the outside without getting too hot. Glad you like it, August smiled. The bathroom is on your left. She turned to a door and opened it, peering inside. She pointed at the toilet and said, What's that for? August ruffled his hair. That's where, you know, go. And that? She pointed at the bathtub. August smiled. That's sort of like an indoor waterfall, just leave it at that. With this statement, he left her to unpack. She giggled. An indoor waterfall? What would these humans think of next? Alora let out a long yawn. Surely they had afternoon naps here. She went to her suitcase and rummaged through to find a pretty gown she assumed was for nightwear. Once she had it on, she crawled into bed and hoped the woman did not return. Alora's head sank into the pillows, and she let out a long sigh. Maybe she should choose August. This human life didn't seem to be so bad. Hey, August said, and he peeked in the door. Comfortable? She nodded. He came over to the bed and asked, Mind if I lay here with you? I'm sort of nervous. I know if I stay in my room alone, my mom will come in asking me a million questions about you. Will she mind if you're in here? She asked. No, more likely to leave us alone. August crawled onto the bed next to her and nestled his head in her hair, saying, Thank you so much for coming with me. You have no idea what this means. If it makes you happy, I'm more than willing to do it, Alora said softly. She loved that he was so near to her. She could hear his heartbeat. I owe you a big time for this one. I know you didn't want to leave home. You don't owe me anything, Alora said, cupping his head in her hand. You needed me to be here for you. That's all that matters. His soft smile lit up the room. I don't really know if this is the moment, but, uh, Alora, would you like to be my girlfriend? He blushed redder than he ever had before. Was a girlfriend like a mate? She supposed that it was something like that. Her insides warmed like the sun. Yes, yes, I will. He put his arms around her, and she snuggled into his embrace, inhaling in his wonderful scent. I love you, Alora, he sighed, and it felt like her heart exploded inside her chest. I will never ever do anything to hurt you. I will protect you no matter what, from this moment on. They slowly began to fall asleep. When August was unconscious, Alora thought of the windcomer and whispered, You can't protect me from everything, August, but I can protect you. I just wish I knew what to do. A door slammed, a part of yet another argument. After nearly two weeks, Alora knew she couldn't take much more of this, she missed her forest, missed the wide spaces to run in. In the woods, there was privacy. You couldn't get privacy here if you locked yourself in the bathroom. There were too many people, too many artificial things. Alora felt bad for August. Wolves would just pick a fight and get it over with, but humans dragged it on and on and on. For the first few days, August and his mother had tried to keep the yelling out of Alora's hearing, but eventually, they abandoned the idea altogether and went on to fight louder and louder. Alora disliked the woman. 
Anyone who snapped at August that much was a horrible person in her book, though she had to admit, August did more than his fair share of snapping back. They had been out a few times to try and get some space, but August's mother had obviously noticed Alora's anxiety, and now was doing her best to keep them both in the house. As always, when he was around his mother, August complained. It was simply unbearable. She wanted to go home. It had been a horrible idea to come here in the first place. She knew it wouldn't be long now. Soon she would be in wolfskin. Time was running out for her. Alora sighed and looked out her window. She wondered how long it would take her if she ran all the way back home, if she would make it in time. The door opened. Alora saw that August had red-rimmed eyes. She rose from the bed and he said, Come on, we're sneaking out. She didn't ask any questions. She followed August down the stairs and to the back part of the house, to the room farthest away from his mother's. Alora copied his actions as he slid through the window and onto the ground a few feet below. He avoided the streetlights. She avoided them, too, because they reminded her of the windcomer's penetrating stare. As August charged ahead of her, she looked into the blank, open sky and thought, Could it be possible? Am I the last and mortal there is? What reason would the windcomer have to lie? It was a cloudless night. Alora thanked the sanctifier that the windcomer's footsteps were nowhere to be seen. They didn't run for long before the houses ended and warm sand began. August caught his breath, pointed, and said, That's an ocean. Alora's very breath was taken away. Never in all her life had she seen such a great expanse of water. It went on forever, from one corner of the world to another, stretching far out into the distance without having an end. August went down to the shoreline. They walked along it until they came upon a hammock that was suspended between two palm trees. They laid down in it together, resting up against one another. August pointed out the stars. See that one? I forgot its name, but it's very bright. Alora braced herself. August, we have to go back. He looked down and traced her hand with his finger. I don't want to go back to my mom's now. No, August, I mean we have to go back to the lakes. August looked up. Why? Why is it so important for you to go back? We could leave now, together. He sat up in the hammock. I could buy a car. We could run away. If we both worked, I'm sure that we could afford an apartment eventually. We'd never have to go back. I have enough in my bank account to support us both until we can stand on our own. August, that's not right. Your parents love you and you love them, Alora said firmly. You're too young to go into the world by yourself just yet. And you aren't? He asked angrily. You've been living on your own for years. You're being a hypocrite. She didn't answer, looking back at the sky and the stars. How she wished she could rise up again to glide among them. He shook his head. I'll never understand you, Alora. I thought you wanted to be with me. I do, August, more than anything, she said, and her heart ached. But things are too complicated right now. He sighed, wrapping his arm tighter around her. I know, but the most uncomplicated thing in the world is the fact that I love you, and all I want is you. I'd give the whole world up as long as you were with me. He made her want him all over again. She sighed. Let's not worry about anything right now. Let's look at the constellations. What one is that again? As August continued his descriptions, Alora leaned against his chest, knowing it was too good to be true. August had lied when he said he wouldn't do anything to hurt her. Already, before she had even made her decision, he had stolen her heart. Finally, it was time to leave the great water. Alora waited patiently as the woman gave August a small kiss on the cheek at the airport. The son left with a short goodbye. Alora went to follow him, but before she could leave, the mother grabbed her arm. Take care of him, will you? The woman asked. He's all I have. Small tears had peeked in her eyes. Understanding flowed between them. Despite her cruelty, this woman did happen to care. With a mutual gaze of empathy, Alora said, I'll do my best. 
The woman nodded, and Alora left her alone. Once they boarded the plane, Alora suddenly felt angry at August. His mother truly loved him, and he wanted to abandon her by running away? Something else grew unbidden within her. Unexpected bitterness. He still had his parents. Her own were gone. Could he not be grateful for what he had and what she did not? She took her seat by his side icily and didn't speak to him all the way home. Once they had reached his cabin, August prepared to say goodbye. He went to open his mouth, but before he could get a word in edgewise, Alora said, You weren't very nice to your mother, you know. August's body went rigid. Excuse me? She started it. If you haven't noticed, she hasn't exactly been the kindest to me all my life. She left Dad for crying out loud. Is that your excuse? She asked, arms crossed. Your mother left your father, so you take revenge by making her miserable whenever she gets a chance to be with you? You've got to be kidding me, August said. You're siding with her? I thought you cared about me. Stay on one subject, August, she said. We're talking about your mother here. You don't know anything about my mom, he hissed. No, but I do know something about you, Alora said. I know you can never be yourself when you're around anyone but me. You completely change your attitude to suit whoever you're with. Todd and Dustin? You become someone you're not when you're with them. Sometimes I wonder if you really want me or just want to play games. I just want people to like me. What's so bad about that? He said desperately. And who's playing games? You love me one minute, then avoid me the next. You don't know how to feel about me. Don't think I don't notice. He shouted as Alora shrank back. Alora bit back a comment. This had to be it. She couldn't keep it from him any longer. She had to make her decision. At that exact moment, Snow began dancing through the air. Oh no! She gasped. Snow was starting to fall on the trees. Alora began shaking. Alora! Alora, what's wrong? August asked. He rushed forward, but Alora batted him away, and he went flying into his front door. Before he hit the ground, Alora was on all four paws, crashing into the trees that tore at her fur. Her body became bruised as she smashed insanely into whatever got in her way. The forest seemed vacant and strange to her now. Places she had loved so much were now distant from her memory. She forgot about Tanglemane and that he had ever existed. She forgot about her home or the waterfall. She forgot that she wasn't really a wolf, but a girl. She even forgot her name. The only things she didn't forget about were the Windcomer and August. Her breathing became ragged. She ran as if stuck in honey. The snow halted during her rampage, and freezing rain in its place began to fall. It coated her fur and sent her crawling into a leaky cave, dripping and slick. Desperately, Alora curled up and went to sleep, hanging on to what little memory she had of being an mortal. Chapter 9 Through the Heart Weeks passed like this, Alora scrabbling to hold on to herself. She had forgotten how to hunt, so she resorted to catching and eating the livestock the few farmers close by kept. She planned to only steal one every few days to avoid suspicion, but her hunger became ravenous and uncontrollable. During broad daylight, she would snag four or five sheep from the flock, only to come back around during midnight for two more. Their bones laid scattered around her leaky cave. She resorted to laughing at them, giving them faces and names. The birds above her cave wondered if she had gone mad. Instead of loving the snow, Alora hated it. She grumbled at it, as if it could hear her complaints, and kicked it around like dirt in her sleeping spot. She tried to fly once, and only managed to leap off the branch of the tree she had climbed before she fell several feet into the snow. Many times Alora tried to fly, but her wings just wouldn't work. Her anmortal magic was gone, and so her wings no longer flew. They became limp and dragged along the ground. They slowed her up so much, Alora tried gnawing them off. The blood soaked her feathers and turned them red. 
The windcomer haunted her every move. Whether he was there or not, Alora always waited for him to strike. He had caused her to feel something she had never felt. Worry. And now the worry was clawing her up from the inside, eating her very soul alive. Be a man, Todd snarled, laying the shotgun down on the kitchen table. August looked at it warily and said, I don't know, guys. Maybe we shouldn't be taking this into our own hands. My dad lost his job because of the sheep killer, Todd snapped. If we don't stop it, it could kill the whole flock, maybe even start stealing kids. Do you want that? August didn't answer. Dustin leaned forward and said, Look, it'll only take the three of us to kill the wolf. You heard the authorities. They're not going to do a damn thing about it until next week. By then, all the sheep will be gone and my dad will be out of a job. Then your dad will be broke because there's no one with enough money to buy his fish. Before you know it, we're all screwed. It's the middle of winter. We could starve while the wolf is getting fat. Just a few shots in the woods, and it's all over. Got it? But there's a girl out in the woods. Alora, August protested. We won't hit the girl. Dustin rolled his eyes. Jeez, can't you tell an animal from a person? She probably already got eaten by the wolf. August's eyes widened. No, she's fine. She couldn't have gotten hurt. I've been looking for her. She's just hiding because of our argument. Anything could have happened out there with that wolf running around. What makes you think it would flinch to attack a girl? Dustin asked. Revulsion clenched in his gut. If anything has hurt her, I'll kill it, August said instantly. Then go protect her, Todd said. August grabbed the gun and the three boys headed out, August leading the way. He was burning, intent on his task. He would find the sheep killer and slaughter it where it stood. He would protect the girl he loved. This was the right thing. And if it wasn't, then that was just fine with him. Nothing meant more to him than keeping Alora safe. If he didn't kill the wolf, Todd and Dustin would. But there would be no chance of that. He was a much better gunman than the other two, and when the time came, there was no chance the bullet wouldn't hit its target. Alora walked slowly through the snow, her white wings dragging behind her. She was going to nab another sheep. The taste of penned prey was on her lips, and she had grown attached to it. Sheep were so much easier to hunt than the wild things, and they provided so much more meat. Her mouth watered in anticipation. The farm was in plain sight. All she had to do was cross these few trees. She slunk down, her giant paws making little noise as her cat-like form twisted through the brush. Alora smelled the air. As she did so, her heart shivered. Something was wrong. All her life she had never hunted without a bird song or crackling in the brush. Where was all the noise? The sound wasn't what she was looking for. Two people were whispering. Her head swiveled to see Todd and Dustin hiding in the trees. She leapt to run when a wonderful, rustic smell met her nostrils. She had known that smell and had adored it every time he drew near. He couldn't be ten feet away. Alora turned and looked at August and saw the raised muzzle of the gun pointed to her skull. The gun banged. Alora jumped into the air, the shot piercing a tree trunk. She heard August swear and Alora turned to run as more shots were fired her way. She had to go faster. She could outrun them, surely. Yet her wings were dragging her down. She looked back as the bullets grazed her fur, coming closer to skin each time. Why can't he recognize me? Why is he doing this? Her mind screamed. Alora tripped, rolling down a large hill, tumbling, tumbling, tumbling and coming to a stop at the rocky edge of a very large waterfall, the same one that she and August had swam under so long ago. She got weakly to her feet. The three boys stared her down, eyes showing no mercy. As they were human, they could not see her wings. To them, she looked like any wolf. August raised the gun and paused, wondering when to shoot. "'What are you waiting for?' Dustin asked. "'Kill it already!' Alora froze in her place. There would be no windcomer now, not unless she begged August to understand. 
She put her head down submissively. Her tail waved back and forth in a friendly fashion, begging him to understand. I choose mortality, she pleaded. I choose to be human. Make me be like him. Make him see that I'm Alora. I choose to love him. At the height of the waterfall, she looked into August's eyes, begged him to see her, to see reason. Yet August wasn't to be reasoned with. He pulled the trigger, and Alora felt a sharp pain in her left shoulder. Royal blood ran onto her thick white fur, and she fell backwards over the waterfall and into the rocks below. It's dead, Dustin said. The boys traveled down the waterfall to the pool below to look for the wolf's body. The icy pool below the waterfall turned a garnet red. Are you sure? I know I got it, but it's not right for the thing to suffer. I don't think it harmed Alora after all. It wouldn't attack humans, August said, lowering his weapon. It didn't attack us because we were in a group, but still alive after losing all that blood? Dustin scoffed. Get real. That thing crawled off somewhere to die. I guess so, August said. He shrugged before saying, Come on, guys. Let's get home before the critters start smelling all this blood. I'm freezing. There were mutters of agreement as the boys left. Under a patch of bushes a few feet away, Alora lay panting, blood still leaking from her wound. She had hit the rocks hard and couldn't tell if anything was broken. It wouldn't matter, though. She was losing too much blood. She knew that within hours, she would be dead. August had done this to her. August had been the reason she had lost Tanglemane, lost her memory, the reason why Windcomer was playing games. Despite all her agony, she felt a small spurt of triumph. Now the Windcomer had lost, for the first time in his life. He would never eat her up, because her true love had struck her down himself. And even now, for whatever reason, she still loved him. Alora closed her eyes, listened to the snow trickle to the ground, and waited to die. Jesse, look here, see what I found, a voice hushed in the sunlight. Alora couldn't open her eyes, she was far too weak. The bushes ruffled. Alora heard a man let out a ragged gasp. Somebody shot a wolf. The farmers probably got tired of whatever creature is taking their sheep, a female responded. Might as well take it back to the reserve. Maybe the poor creature still has a chance. Go get a muzzle, the female said. Alora felt someone cautiously put something over her mouth, binding it. Do you think we should use a tranquilizer? the man asked. No, she's near death. Drugs could kill her. We'll just be very careful, the woman replied. Alora felt her paws be tied, then strong arms cradled her against a rough body. Alora's wings trailed along the ground, but neither the man nor the woman noticed. She pulled her wings inside as the humans shut the bars of some sort of box that contained her inside. Cold metal vibrated under her body. She must be in a car, in some sort of metal cage. In the past, the simple thought of this would have made Alora scream aloud. It didn't matter much to her now. Why don't I just die already? she thought once, then curled back into unconsciousness. The next time Alora awoke, she felt much better. There was a twinge in her shoulder where the bullet had gone in, an itching more than a pain. She leaned upward to observe what it could be. As she did, her brain was sent into shock. Someone had shaved off a part of her beautiful fur. Irritated, she looked closer and saw that all the blood that had been on her coat was gone. There were small black stitches in her side where Og, the human, had shot her. She rose to her feet with a bit of discomfort, shaking her head back and forth, taking in her surroundings. She was in a forest, yet it was not the one she had known all her life. It smelled strange and seemed lonely. She traveled through the foliage, which was nothing like her own. When she had walked for a very long time, she ran into something that was cold and bouncy. Confused, she sprang back off of it and looked up in horror. Fence. Ragged fencing ran a long line down the center of the forest, 
and as far as she could see. Now that her health was back, Alora remembered how much her freedom meant to her, and now that he was gone, it meant everything. In a distinct panic, she charged at the fence for a while and ran alongside it, hoping it would end, but it was no use. She was encompassed by its large spread. After hours of running, heaving and hot, Alora sat back on her haunches, shaking. You can't escape. A chill ran down her spine. The windcomer was waiting there beside her, his tail of chains lashing, his spotlight eyes bright. He creaked and cranked as he laid down, looking at her with interest. Alora's mind spun. Why would the windcomer be here now? She had chosen mortality. She would change back once the first spring came. What did she mean to him now? You are inside a sanctuary, the windcomer said, a human reserve for injured animals. They are nursing you back to health. Consider yourself lucky you are still alive. She couldn't reply. She was an animal. What could she say? And as for being still alive, that was a complete mystery. Why didn't the windcomer just kill her now? The mechanical beast stretched. Humans are easily deceived. Once I put a veil over their eyes, they thought you were just a strange-looking wolf. The windcomer coughed, and smoke tumbled out of his mouth. Her ears went back, and her tail drooped. He yawned and said, Oh yes, Alora, I am still hunting you. I have you in my grasp, right now, with just one swipe. He rolled onto his back, of my paw. You would be dead, and I would have you devoured. But I don't want to let you go. He rolled back onto his stomach again. You're far too pretty a thing for me to waste. I like watching you. The way you run, the way your eyes glint in the moon, even your wings, damaged and useless as they are, seem lovely to me. Your antics are very amusing. Perhaps I will not eat you until you are old, or I have grown tired of you. And you will grow old, just like all mortals. But that's what you wanted, isn't it? I know what you chose, dear Alora. Alora glared back at him, but she didn't dare to take a step closer to him or inch farther away. The windcomer snorted. Besides, he creaked. It wouldn't be fun at all if I missed your reaction. It is a rare time that I get to see an anmortal in such devastation. Once you realize the truth, you will be searching for me to kill you. I will not oblige, of course. It won't be long before I'll decide your fate. She leaned backwards. What was he saying? Was there some great truth that she didn't understand yet? May the sanctifier deal with you— she hissed in her brain, almost wishing despite her fear that she could say it aloud. The windcomer looked to the side. They want to put another wolf in here with you. Try not to hurt it, he said. Dragging his tail behind him, he melted into the trees, and the only thing Alora could see of him now was his face. The humans were being loud. Curious, she trotted over. As the windcomer had said, the humans didn't recognize her for what she really was. They paid no attention to her great wings that were dragging rocks through the mud. A strange scent rose up to Alora's nose. It smelled of dirt, not lakes, and was old. Alora turned to see the man, Jesse, standing beside a cage different than hers. She came up to the fence and stared, curious. Easy, girl, Jesse whispered to her. A few other humans were watching on the other side of the fence, and one had a gun. Alora had certainly seen enough of those. Alora growled at him, but the man holding the gun did not move away, only stood his ground. On the other side of the fence, Jesse opened up the box. Out lagged an old male wolf. His dark fur tingled with gray. The instant he sensed her, the wolf started whimpering and cowering away. It knew her for what she was. Alora grew furious at the sight. Who was this wolf? What was he doing here, standing in her way and taking up her territory? 
The fences may be holding her in, but inside the small perimeter, the land she roamed was hers. Joe, get the tranquilizer ready, Jessie said. Alora charged at the wolf, her fangs snarling and bitter. The old creature yelped and cowered away as she hit the fence separating them, foaming at the mouth. The humans yelled, and there was a needle in her side. Alora thumped to the ground and lost consciousness again. From then on, Alora was isolated from all the other animals. The humans tried many times to get her to socialize with the other wolves that came to recover, but it became a lost cause. Alora was cruel to them all. If the humans had not stopped her every time, she would have not wasted a second slaughtering each one. She roamed her boundaries alone and ate the meat that was given to her by Jessie, pacing back and forth along the fence until she made a rut that was muddy and rough. She never slept in the shelter they provided for her. She stood outside in the winter snow and rain, gazing inside the reserve building until her keepers had become wary of her stare. She was always watching. She would do everything in her power to make them let her go. While she was pacing the fence, questions passed through her mind. The winter grew longer, and she wondered why the windcomer even bothered stalking her. Alora knew she was mortal. She knew her body was dying. She could feel herself getting older every instant. For the first time in a thousand years, she had an actual birthday and grew older than sixteen. Months passed like days as she thought over these questions, and she hated her reflection in the stale water she drank. Mortal, she thought nastily, and tipped the tub over. In the reservation, she became known as a brat. Nobody wanted to take her feeding schedule except Jessie, and Jessie was the only one Alora would permit to give her food. He's the only one good enough for me, she thought snobbishly. If anybody else tried to feed her, she would throw dirt over the meat and leave it alone. Finally, the time came when she could feel it in her bones that spring would dawn before next morning. The windcomer came out of the trees with a grand smile, and he sliced the fencing in two with his metal claws. So, she thought, you wanted me in here all along. Very, very slowly, she crawled between the broken fencing and into the freedom of the outside world. She looked back at the windcomer. He screeched as he moved closer. Go on, he said. The lakes are a two-day run from here. Once they discover you are gone, they will be looking for you. And on your third day of escape, so will I. The windcomer disappeared into the trees. Don't disappoint me. Alora flung herself forward and didn't look back. Her paws pounded against rough stone and yellow grass, her muscles aching. The chase is on, she hummed dully. Alora forced herself not to be grateful that the windcomer had given her a head start. It never crossed her mind to use her wings. After the long months in the sanctuary, she had all but forgotten she had them. She had to slow down the pace when she became tired. She was mortal now, and her stamina wasn't what it used to be. She didn't stop for nightfall, but continued onward towards her home. She could travel much faster in wolfskin than her regular form, and now that she had chosen to be human, she would travel that much slower once she transformed. Speed was of the essence. She had to put as much distance between her and the reservation as possible, if not for her sense of smell and a strong internal instinct that pulled her towards the lakes, she would have become lost in the dark. There was no point in resting anyway. She would have no strength to fight off the windcomer when he finally came for her. Maybe he would keep to his promise to let her live until she grew old. The beast had tendencies to be cruel before. Her speed was so great, she made it to her lakes in half the time the windcomer had told her it would take. When she stopped there, however, her limbs were not only filled with exhaustion, but dread. It was already spring here. Flowers were in full blossom, and the scent of new life overpowered her nostrils so much that she sneezed. Plants were budding like never before, and the grasses were as tall as her stomach line. She cocked her head, confused. She should be a girl by now. Tiredness overtook her. I must go to sleep first, she thought. Last night was a flaw. 
The change cannot take place until I am asleep. Alora laid down in a fresh patch of honeysuckle, put her tail over her muzzle, and drifted into dreamland. Chapter 10 The Replacement It was another full day closer to the windcomber's arrival. Alora rose to her feet to find a place to hide, yet once she did, a loud cry rose out of her body. She was still in wolfskin. What's going on? she wondered. She turned around on the spot, looking over her fur, her tail, her wings. It was all wrong. Shivering, but not because of the spring chill, she thought, There must still be snow on the ground. That is the reason why I haven't changed. She traveled throughout the forest to try and find some snow to prove her theory, but found none. She looked for clues from the animals, but they all avoided her more than usual, as if she had some deadly disease. Even the trees themselves seemed to slink away from her, as if repulsed by what she was. But what am I? Alora wondered pitifully, becoming frantic in her search. The next morning came, and she was still in wolfskin. There was no chance of there still being snow, as she was sweltering in the heat. The change is late this year, she thought. One day it will happen. It always has, and I believe it always will. Days passed. Alora waited for the change, but with each dawn, she was still in the same body. Her coat grew thinner, and she lost her winter fur, yet she never became a girl. What was more, Alora could sense the windcomer had returned. His stench hung on the air in more places than she would have liked. It had a mocking air to it, as if the wretched thing knew something she didn't. Spring turned into summer, and there was still no change. Alora grew impatient, trying to force herself into the change by sleeping all hours of the day, but it made no difference. Eating plants only made her more hungry and trying on the clothes she found lying in her old hut only made her hotter underneath her fur. She stayed away from all farm animals. She had learned her lesson on that. Summer turned into fall. By this time, Alora was feeling utterly miserable and confused. It should be the time when she would be preparing for wolfskin, not coming out of it. The leaves fell from the trees, and she gazed up at the full moon, one of the last before the first snowfall. When are you coming? She whispered to her inner self. I can feel that you're trapped inside. Come out, mortal girl, and be what you chose to be. The sunlight was beaming on her face, creating rays of warmth that spread across her tanned skin. Her deerskin dress flowed over her body as she ran through the grass on two legs. Her laughter rang out among the skies and merged with the clouds that hovered above her, the birds flew, and the animals watched every movement as Michigan lilies sprang where she stepped. Everything was as it had been. She could smell every possible scent that reigned within the lakes. Her eyesight was so sharp, she could see for miles ahead, see every single tendril that made the flowers below her. She vibrated with life and was no longer dying, no longer growing old. Yet all of this could not compare with what she heard next. Alora, A warm voice behind her hummed. She turned to see August, his arms wrapped around her, his hold gentle. She let out a cry of joy and tackled him to the ground, clinging to him with all her might and snuggling into his shirt. The past few months were forgotten. It was as if he had never shot her. She smiled. I have been looking for you. I have too, he murmured brushing a lock of hair out of her face. Where have you been? Here and there. Nowhere you need to be concerned about. Alora laughed. August shook his head. You're so secretive and wild. Nothing can tame you. You're like the wind. Alora leaned forward to plant a kiss on his lips. He returned the affection thankfully. I don't ever want this moment to end, August sighed. Alora leaned into him. Maybe it won't. Perhaps it'll go on forever. Alora woke up. She felt as if she could stand on two legs, but she growled out with frustration when she saw she was still in wolfskin. 
Furious, she grabbed a branch with her teeth and snapped it in two. When would it end? Alora began pacing in a circle. What hurt the most was she remembered that the dream was truly a memory. It was before the windcomer had arrived, before she left with August to Florida, and before he had shot her in her shoulder, which may as well have been her heart. It was the summer before she had to deal with all these stupid decisions. Before, when her heart was quietly content, not filled with the raging waves that crashed inside it now. Alora went to hunt. It took her all day, but she finally managed to fall an old buck. She took her time while eating and didn't bother watching her back. The animals in the forest wouldn't come near what she had eaten off of. Half of the stag was gone already, yet Alora still tore at it ravenously and in a rage, staining her beautiful white fur red. Your wings are still useless, a steely voice behind her grated. Alora didn't look back, but she stopped eating. She couldn't be completely disrespectful to the windcomer, not if she wanted to stay alive. But still, she resented him. She sat down and kept her back turned, one eye on him at all times. The windcomer chuckled, and it sent shivers down her fur. He reached out his long claws. Ah, you are a daring one, you are. Alora held back a lowly whine. The windcomer was using the dead stag as a puppet, making the body of the creature dance in his claws. The poor deer's eyes seemed more blank than usual. Half of its uneaten corpse was dripping with thick liquid, innards sloshing on the ground. Highly entertained, the windcomer looked at her with an interested smile. Her nose wrinkled in distaste. She said, You really should have more respect for the dead. Alora clamped a paw over her mouth, shocked she had spoken. The windcomer pretended not to hear her voice, though his own metal ears pricked up. He let the stag drop and Alora slunk away. She wouldn't touch it now. You could make me talk all along, then, Alora said. The sound of her voice was strange to her. He narrowed his spotlight eyes. No, no, I could not. Then why am I speaking now? She asked, growing bolder. Her tail rose up and hope bloomed in her heart. Maybe she was getting close to changing back. Do not ask me, he said. It only makes you more valuable, a beast that can talk. He laughed as if the idea was comical. What do you mean? Alora asked, her interest piqued. The windcomer creaked. What do you think it means? It was quiet for quite some time before Alora figured it out. The windcomer raised a great metal eyebrow, and it took all of Alora's power not to bare her teeth. So that's what you want me for, Alora responded, and her tail lashed behind her viciously. A trophy? It's no great feat to say that you devoured all the Anmortals that ever were, but if you can say that you tamed one, that you controlled a creature that was said could never be tamed, that would be the real victory. Indeed, the windcomer nodded. Taking away your freedom almost gives me enough of a reason not to eat you. Your flesh would be so tasty, as beautiful as you are. The windcomer licked his lips, and Alora saw that his tongue was sparked with iron spikes. It's all you ever really wanted, isn't it? To remain free. Not really, Alora whispered in her mind, and she was glad that the windcomer didn't know everything. An image of August broke into her head his face smiling, arms open wide. The breeze tumbled through the reeds, and Alora thought of taking a trip to the lakes soon. She would have to get away from the windcomer first. It wouldn't be a problem, since he wanted her alive, for now. Alora stood her ground fearlessly as the windcomer came closer. Maybe I was wrong, he said, and he moved in a circle around her. You still love him, don't you? Even after all he did to you, you still have feelings for him. She didn't answer. The windcomer moved closer to her and looked into her eyes. She dropped her gaze, hiding what emotion she could. The windcomer laughed. It was a horrible sound, like the rasping of trees crashing into each other during a storm. Oh, Alora, you are full of surprises. 
I would have never expected this from you. It only makes you more appealing. I'm not your toy, Alora snapped, and she brought her paw up to smash the giant spotlight eye that was staring her in the face. The glass in front of it shattered, and the beast roared in pain. Alora was running swiftly away before he could catch up with her. For the moment, of course. By the time she had gotten to the lakeshore, the forest had grown quiet with the windcomer's screams. Alora watched the waves rolling in and out, wishing that she too could be swept out to the center of the cold, deadly lake. There would be nowhere in the world the windcomer wouldn't follow, and there was no way she could ever outrun him. She was marked for death. She may as well blind the enemy on her way out. Another winter came and went. Alora realized with a pang that she had gone more than a full year without seeing August. It doesn't matter, Alora thought sadly, but in all reality, it made all the difference to her. When the second springtime in wolfskin rolled around, the windcomer became a frequent visitor. He rarely let her out of his sight, always keeping his one good eye on her. She ignored him as best she could and pretended like he wasn't there. She said nothing, and neither did he. Every so often, her gaze flickered back to the broken glass socket where his left eye used to be, but in time she found a way to disregard that, too. The attack had been a hasty move on her part. The windcomer was probably planning to shave a couple years off her lifespan because of it. But then, why did she care? She wanted the windcomer to end it already, but he was patient. He was holding on, enjoying her torment. He wanted to break her, to claim her, to own her. She would not be tamed. Her freedom was all she had left. One day, when her dead wings were limp from the rising heat and she was sweating under her fur, Alora traveled as far as she could throughout the woods without crossing her boundaries. She planned on making herself as tired as possible. If she was exhausted, there may be a better chance she would become human. She still hadn't given up, was refusing to give up. Her heart thumped as her paws hit the pathway where she and August had once walked down to their waterfall together. There was a long, tall ledge that overlooked the lake. She could see for miles around, and the climb itself would take hours. It would be a perfect place to wear herself out. She leapt at the challenge, pushing her every muscle to its extent, and drilling the exercise into her body until she felt her paws would bleed with the effort. By the time she had finished her ascent, it was noon. Panting with victory, she turned around and planned to head back, until her eyes spotted something she did not intend to see. August. He was walking through a grassy plain with a girl she didn't know, a girl with dark skin and a tiny form. The girl was around the same age August was, eighteen now, and looked very happy. She could hear them laughing even from her spot at the top of the cliff. They chased each other around in circles and punched each other playfully, pushing each other around. At the exact time Alora could hear her heart crack, August took her in his arms. Rage filled Alora's veins then. He loved another girl? Another woman? Whom she had no knowledge of? Alora felt as if August had slapped her in the face. He had tossed her aside like some old cloth, a filthy rag that had done its purpose and now had no use. What right did he have to leave her here, devastated, pining? There they were again, playfully following each other into the forest. Alora crouched down until she was invisible in the jagged rocks, holding her breath. She bared her teeth and prepared to soar downward, her tail slowly rising up. Alora let her crunched wings unravel from her body. As she did so, she screamed aloud with a cry of pain. This was not the sharp whine of a wolf, but the cry of a young woman in sorrow. She sunk to the ground and twitched within the bushes, pulling her wings over her body. Her feathery appendages ached from the years of being abused, misused, and mistreated. Whimpers passed by her lips, and her legs jolted from the burning. The windcomer stood over her, shaking his head. My dear, 
You cannot simply forget you can fly for many moons and then expect to dive into the air the next day. It doesn't happen. Alora didn't answer, only let out another moan. The windcomer shook his head again and said, So terrible, and yet so beautiful, to see a creature like you break like this. I remember there was a time when nothing could shatter you, but you were free and forever then, and now everything in your world is opposite of how it should be. Her body went still, except for her lashing tail. The windcomer put his head down by her ear and breathed heavily. Stop squirming so. Your contorted flesh is going to taint the taste. Her eyes popped open. Alora struggled to her feet and glared at the windcomer with all her might. He melted into the rocks below her, and she spat at the ground, disgusted. Both August and the girl were out of sight. Alora threw back her head and let out an enraged howl of grief. Chapter 11 Reflection From then on, Alora hunted August and the girl the same way the windcomer hunted her. She followed their every move, sitting outside August's house and only rising when she saw them come out of it, tracking and tracing each footstep. She ate whatever mindless animal that scrambled into her path and only slept when she was sure August was asleep also. The girl above all angered her the most. She had took away her mate, without any knowledge that he had once loved another. Alora's mouth watered when she looked at the female, her eyes watching and her claws wanting. She could feel the female's scent burn her nose. Every day was the same, stalking, being, and becoming the justice that would fall this monster. It took several weeks, but Alora finally got the opportunity she wanted. For once, August was leaving the girl alone. I'll go back to the house to get us something to drink, he told the girl, and Alora felt her heart jump at his voice. Do you want to come, Clarette? No, thank you. The female shook her head, gazing at the tall trees. They were by the lake, out for an early morning's walk. Clarette sat on a boulder placed in the rocky sand, tossing a small backpack down. I'm going to sit and enjoy the scenery. It's very nice out here. I'll be back soon, August said and he waved goodbye. Alora felt her lips curl within her hiding place, behind the very boulder Clarette was sitting on. With August gone, it would be too easy. This way, when she attacked, there would be no chance August would get hurt. There was no time to waste. Alora leapt on top of the rock, snarling, and landed on top of the girl. Clarette was too surprised to yell. Alora laughed, charging her fangs toward her neck. The girl reacted. She punched her in the nose. Alora's eyes watered in pain, whimpering but still going for the kill. Clarette had time to pick up a large branch and swing it at her, but Alora dodged it easily and lunged for skin, her claws making a huge gash in the girl's leg. Clarette screamed. Clarette tried to limp off, but Alora wouldn't let up and attacked again. This time, Clarette smacked Alora across the face with the branch. Stunned, but not giving up, Alora charged again, until Clarette opened her bag and took out a large can of hairspray, squirting it into the wolf's eyes. Alora let out a sharp whine. She pawed at her face to try and cure the pain, while Clarette limped away as quickly as she could, crying out for help. Alora went to give chase, but something stepped on her tail and she let out a yelp, falling to the sandy earth. She turned on her back and saw the windcomer was holding her down, an almost bored expression on his horrible face. He loves that girl, you know, he said. Her eyes still stinging and her mouth full of sand, she muffled, he loves me more. Surely, he rolled his one eye. Hopefully you won't go blind from the chemicals in that can. Alora wasn't sure what chemicals were, and she wasn't going to stick around to find out. She saw that Clarette had left a trail of blood behind. That's her life source, Alora said. It would be cruel to let her suffer. Unleash me now so I can take her out of her misery. An excuse for you, then. It was merely a gruesome scratch, he said. 
getting worse every year on your hunting skills, aren't we, Alora? She didn't answer. He led her up and she shook her fur free of dirt. It doesn't matter, she responded. I'll get her another time. I think not, the windcomer snorted. Go to the human's house and see what damage you have caused. I will not, Alora said, and she stuck her nose in the air. The windcomer flicked his long tail. Suit yourself. His body glided into the lake, and Alora made sure to watch him until his head was submerged under. Satisfied with her task, the wolf trotted lightly on her feet and thought some more about how to turn into a girl again. Three days came and went, and Alora didn't get the chance to attack Clarette a second time. She hadn't seen her or August, and she wasn't any closer to turning into a girl. In fact, she felt like she was becoming more animal. Alora's logical thoughts were melting into primal blobs of hunger, sleep, and shelter, her most interesting thoughts being the weather. As to speak of the weather, it was terrible. It had been constant rain that not only drowned all the new spring plants, but stuck to Alora's fur and turned to ice. If there's not enough rain, there's too much, she thought sourly as she stared at the droplets hanging off her cave. The windcomer passed by her den. She saw the icicles hanging off his metal body, and without hesitation, she began to follow him. To her amazement, he led her to the cabin that August lived in. The windcomer slid past the window and banged his tail on it. He melted away when Alora put her paws on the sill and looked inside. Clarette was lying on a bed, her face broken out in a sweat and melting with fever. She panted under a heavy blanket, while August's father and August himself stood over her, looking grim. August was holding her hand. How is she, Dad? he whispered. Even though Alora was outside in the pouring rain, she could hear every word that was spoken through the glass. The older man shook his head. We're going to have to take her to the hospital, but I'm afraid she's not going to make the drive. We may have to call a rescue helicopter. How can she be that sick? August asked in a quiet voice. It was only a scratch that a wild dog gave her. Infection has set in. Your mother is going to kill us when she finds out. I should have taken her to the doctor earlier, but the medical bills... Both the man and the boy were silent for a minute. The father dropped his voice. Yell if she gets worse. Okay, August mumbled. As his father left the room, August got up and closed the door. He took Clarette's hand immediately once he sat in a chair by her bedside. Please get better, he whispered, and Alora felt a pit of shame plummet into her stomach. You can't die now, not after all you've been through. It'd be wasted. Alora's ears fell back against her head. August dropped his gaze. Alora could not see his face. I've already lost one girl, he said, and he started to cry. Her name was Alora. We got in a fight two years ago, and I never saw her again after that. I think she either ran away or was killed by a wolf that I shot. I looked and looked, but I never found her body. I don't know what happened to her, but I loved her so much. Things would be easier if I had made up with her before she vanished. I told the police, but nobody had ever heard of her before. They didn't believe me. She vanished out of my life forever. I'm not even sure if she really existed. I can't let that happen to you, too. Clarette didn't answer. August kissed her forehead and went back to being quiet watching the shadows on the bedroom wall with a dulled devastation. In his face, Alora found something she despised much more than the other female. August's pain. Too sick to watch anymore, Alora turned away, her tail between her legs. When she got inside her den, she shivered, watching as water dripped down from the ceiling. The droplets slid off her frozen fur and created a puddle around her feet as she sat in the empty cave, with nobody to hold her. Oddly enough, she never noticed. Days crawled on slowly. Alora felt like she was waiting for something to melt when her heart was frozen as a glacier. Alora only journeyed between her den and the house. 
Everyone had vanished from the cabin, and by the look of things, all three had left in quite a hurry. There had been no sign of any humans for days, and the windcomer wasn't around. Alora wondered why the monster was avoiding her. Hadn't he always stuck around before, constantly stalking her day after day? Yet, in a matter of hours, her frustration turned to worry. What if the windcomer was planning something big? Worse, what if August never came back? By the time Alora saw a red truck pounding up August's gravel driveway, she had created her own path from the den to the house. Her ears perked as she watched through the trees, wondering if Clarette would get out of the car as well, or if it would just be August and his father. Half of her wanted the girl to be gone, but the other half couldn't stand it if Clarette had indeed perished. To her combined relief and discomfort, Clarette came out alive, wrapped in a blanket, and helped out of the vehicle by August. The human girl walked slowly to the house, pale, fragile, and in terrible shape, but still living. That was enough for Alora. She planned to head back to the den, but a curious growling caught her ears. Alora crept to see what was lurking in the dark. She stopped when she saw him, a large grizzly bear who was staring at the truck with hungry eyes. This was no average bear, however. The large creature's mouth frothed with disease and madness. The bear had his eyes set on August and Clarette. Fury flashing in her eyes, Alora walked calmly out of the grasses and stood in his path. She couldn't touch the animal for fear of getting sick herself, but she would not let this creature attack them. Whatever she was, an mortal, girl, or wolf, she was still queen of the lakes, nonetheless. As commander, she ordered that August and his family would be safe from harm. She would enforce that. Would he attack her? Illness had driven him insane, yet Alora seemed to have an insanity about her, too, a terrible ghastliness that even the mad bear seemed to sense. Turning away from her, the bear roared once and started heading the other way. By the way he was walking, Alora sensed he would be dead before dusk. Haven't we changed our mind about things? A steely voice on the other side of her grated. Alora turned her head to see the windcomer his iron back newly wet from swimming in the lake. There you are, Alora exclaimed, as if greeting an old friend rather than her worst enemy. Where did you go? I have looked and called, but found you nowhere. I have been following you, he said, in a voice that made it seem like it was obvious. You just never saw me. Oh, she said. It was quiet for a minute as they looked at each other up and down. Why do you want me so badly? Alora asked. Not even a trophy is worth all this effort. The windcomer still looked at her with his hungry eye. Depends on who you ask. It concerns you, she said slowly. And although I know you love to collect prizes, she looked at his iron stomach warily. If you wanted a possession, you would have eaten me already. Stop lying to me and tell me what you really desire— Maybe I can give it to you, and then you can leave me alone. Do you really want me out of your life that badly? He said, amused. I think you've grown quite attached to me. I think not, Alora said, her stomach clenching with the lie. Tell me. The windcomer blinked his eyes slowly. He turned his head from side to side, cautious, thinking deeply. Finally, he answered, Your soul. The wind whistled through the pine trees. My soul? You want my soul? Yes, your soul. That is all, he said. Alora shook her head and laughed softly. That is a high price. But it's worth it, is it not? The windcomer said. I can change you. You can be human. The air shimmered in front of her until there was a perfect picture of herself as a girl, smiling and more beautiful than she had ever been. A second image of August appeared, one where he put his strong arms around her and planted a kiss in her long, radiant hair. You will be able to love the boy for as long as you live. As long as my body exists, you mean, she snapped. Besides, August loves someone else now. 
Her voice dropped down to a low sadness as she watched the images fade away. You will be so beautiful that he will forget all about her, the windcomer purred. Wouldn't it be nice to discover why you cannot change? You are mortal now, are you not? You gave up your immortal life on this earth in order to live with him. Why not your eternal life as well? I cannot give you my soul for my life. How silly do you think I am to give you the part of me that never dies? She snorted. Then give the boy your soul, the windcomer said. You've sacrificed enough, haven't you? You deserve happiness. Alora went to bite back another reply, but the windcomer shushed her. Just a few words. Make your soul mine. Give me power over you, he said. After that, you can have everything you've ever dreamed of. You could change me back, Alora said quickly. Yes, but at a price. One too high to count, she said. I am devoted to the sanctifier. My soul is meant to shine in the great lights with my ancestors. My soul does not belong to me. Take it back, he whispered. It's not like following your morals has left you happy. Now has it? I wouldn't know how to live without a soul, Alora said. A soul is the very part of being an mortal. It is our freedom. But you are no longer an mortal, the windcomer said. Become like the humans. How? It's easy. Humans are so blinded by their need for explanation that they forget there is a world beyond greater than the one they can see. They are blinded by their greed. A soul means nothing to them. Why can't it be nothing to you? Then we must change them, Alora insisted. The windcomer snorted. Our kind cannot change humans. They continue their wars without realizing the very death of the spirits within them. But they are useful to us, Alora stated. In ways, but they have forgotten their purpose. Humans aren't all bad. I have seen it, Alora insisted, remembering the beautiful heaven-sent look in August's eyes. No, but at the start of each day they choose what path to take, Alora and they will always choose that path which benefits themselves. Remember that. Do not judge them. You've done much yourself. As have you. The windcomer burst, and his laughter shook the trees. So why are you trying to convince me to give up my soul, when we both know there is a world beyond? Alora said slowly. Because your boy doesn't believe in it, and we both know you love him. If you give up this part of yourself, you can be together without anything getting in the way. You will be the same. Humans can never love and mortals, but humans can love other humans. And that's what you want above anything, isn't it? You have lived for an eternity, Alora, and you have never been happy. You are tired of endlessly going on. You deserve a quick end to it all and I am offering you a way out. Alora couldn't say. She knew what she wanted in her heart, but she didn't know if it was right. Come now, the windcomer said, and he stepped a little closer. Be reasonable. I will never give you my soul, Alora finally said, tail lashing and teeth growling. You will not even give it up to the boy, he pursued. Not even to him, she shook her head. But he loves you. If he really loved me, he wouldn't think of asking for such a thing in the first place, she said. Especially not if he knew I was still alive. He doesn't have to ask for it. You just have to give it to him. The windcomer stomped his foot, becoming impatient. Alora shook her head once more. I refuse. This is the one thing you cannot have. The windcomer said nothing for a very long time. Very well. But no, I will break you, Alora. You cannot hold out on me forever. I will find my own way to transform myself back, thank you, Alora said curtly. How has that been working for you? He asked. When she didn't answer, he laughed cruelly and said, Oh, the choices we make. If only it didn't matter what state we made them in. He drifted away, 
losing the fight but not the war. He would be back soon, she knew, to ask again, to pester her over and over, to give him her soul. This was a large treasure indeed, for the windcomer had never taken a soul before. This was the real reason he hadn't killed her. Until he broke her, and broke her completely by consuming her spirit, he would never be satisfied. She didn't know what she was going to do. Alora trotted closer to the cabin, keeping out of sight but making sure that August was within hers. She slunk to the window and looked in to see the small group gathered around the kitchen table, the men laughing together while Clarette smiled weakly. Even though she had been brought back to life, it would take her some time to heal. The windcomer wanted her soul. How could he even ask for such a thing? He knew she would never give it to him. That was the deepest loss of freedom that he could ever take from an unmortal. Did he really think she would give it to him in exchange for a human life? She heard August's voice inside the house. Alora had to admit that the thought was tempting. But in all reality, what was the use? Would August even want her now, with this new girl in the way? Why did the windcomer insist, over and over, that she play his games? Oh, the choices we make. If only it didn't matter what state we made them in. The windcomer hummed in her head. Alora scratched the ground absent-mindedly. The state she was in. It was wolfskin, of course. If he kept on pushing her to choose, he would eventually get what he wanted. But the longer Alora stalled, the longer he would be kept at bay, and the better chance she had of getting out of this mess. The state we're in. August laughed again inside the house. Alora looked up to see inside, but instead saw only her reflection in the window, the furry white head of a wolf. The answer to all her questions slammed into her, and it was worse than the pang of the bullet, the smash of the rocks against her skin, and the stinging of August's rejection combined. She had been in wolfskin when she decided to love August. When an anmortal received a shortened life, you were stuck in the form you had made the decision in. She had chosen to love August in wolfskin, so now she was stuck in wolfskin and wouldn't ever change back. A single diamond tear ran down her face and onto her fur. She truly had lost her anmortality, as she had grown miserable enough to cry. She was a human girl stuck in a wolf's body. She had human feelings, and she loved a human boy. She heard the laughter of August inside the warm house, the sound that Alora loved to hear. She would gladly stay in wolfskin forever just to remember that laugh. Alora watched and saw the light pouring through the window on August's face. She saw how much he loved this girl and what she meant to him. Alora understood that no one noticed her here, a lone wolf outside the window. A blade was shoved into her heart, yet it was almost soothed by seeing August's gleeful expression. Gritting her teeth and digging her nails into the dirt, Alora did what she knew she must. She let August go. That was love. She understood now. Love was sacrificing everything you had and never expecting anything in return. She loved August enough that all she wanted was his happiness. If loving another girl meant that he would be happy, then she would let him love her. It had been wrong to try and hold on to him before, to follow him and try to change his mind. That was taking his freedom away, and that was being greedy. No matter how horrible Alora felt, she would put herself through decades of pain if it meant that August could have just one more smile upon his face. A choking cry was let out of her throat just then. Sobbing, Alora staggered away into the forest and against several trees, beside herself with emotion. When she made it to her den, she collapsed on the ground and curled up into a ball. I was never a queen, she thought. I was never any better than any other creature in the wood. I once thought that I was worth more than any mortal, but now I see that my pride has caused my downfall. Now I am humble, but the price that I paid to learn my lesson came at too high of a cost. She thought of August again, and the cave swirled around her. I was wrong to try and own him, to try and make him mine. I love him, but he cannot love me, and that is his choice. Her body shuddered as she took a breath. 
I was once the last and mortal, but now I am nothing. Chapter 12 Only One Sacrifice Months passed, but it made no difference to Alora. She was shattered beyond comparison, more broken than she had ever been in her life. The hope that August would love her again, or even see her for what she was, had disintegrated in her heart like summer snow. Nothing mattered. She wasn't hungry. Food held no interest as she procrastinated hunting for days. The only thing she was really interested in was sleep. Perhaps I can run away, she thought vaguely. Being mortal, the wood no longer needs me. Maybe I'll find a nice, young wolf nearby and we'll start a pack together. This doesn't have to be the end of the world. Once I put myself back together, I'll go out looking for one. It doesn't feel like it, but I'm still alive, aren't I? The notion passed to Alora she might not be alive. She dragged herself to the waterfall that she and August had once swam in, the waterfall that she only dreamed about now, and stared at her reflection. As far as she could tell, she wasn't yet a ghost. Sighing, she closed her eyes and flopped down by the bank. The sunlight warmed her fur, but it was soon blocked out by a large shadow. Alora didn't have to open her eyes to guess who it was. "'What more do you want from me?' she breathed. "'You got what you wanted. I am mortal, and I can never be with August. You have taken my love, my body, and what I am. Isn't that enough?' The windcomer lay next to her side. It is never enough. She snorted. Three things are never satisfied. Death, destruction, and man. I suppose I can count you as death and destruction. You may count me man as well. The machine cranked. He put his head beside her and said, You can still have it all, you know. Everything. You're not getting my soul. Alora said in a tired voice. Why are you so stubborn? Many humans don't even believe souls are real, the windcomer said. I was an mortal once, she said. I could feel my soul, and I'm almost sure humans can too, if they try hard enough. I can't ignore what I feel. Why not? It is easy. Forget, he shrugged. And mortals can never forget. The windcomer laughed. Oh, Alora, what I have to offer you is more real than your memories. The gentle breeze became a swirling whirlwind, and the windcomer's form changed from a horrible metal monster to a beautiful, handsome man, a man that was more striking than August ever had been or ever would be. His dark hair and bright eyes seemed to ripple through her body. He was totally naked, muscular arms stretched out toward her and begging her to release herself to him. Alora looked down and realized that she too was now human, her form unclothed, her hair long and free. The windcomer swept in and imprisoned her in a warm embrace, invading her mouth and soul with a kiss that tasted like metal, their bodies pressing together and merging as one. As he kissed her, Alora realized the whole terrible truth of it. She hated the windcomer with everything she had, but she loved him too, and it was nothing like the love she had held for August. Her anmortal self had despised the windcomer for everything he was, but her mortal self adored him with a passion that was mixed with fear, anger, and awe. The windcomer possessed her, obsessed her. He was everything she had been and ever could be. Alora needed him as he needed her. They were two parts of the same monster, half angel and half devil. To deny him would be to run from herself. There would be no escaping him, now and forever. The windcomer leaned down and whispered into her ear, Do you want to remain damaged and broken, or would you like to be perfect? Everyone wants to be perfect, Alora. Your soul is all I ask. Then you will have everything you could ever dream of. I love you, Alora. I desire you. Give yourself to me and let yourself be consumed by who I am. Let me own you. Alora hesitated. In her mind, 
She saw herself as more flawless than she ever was, controlling each whim of the woodland as she had before. At the windcomer's side all the creatures, even humans, bowed in her wake. Then she saw the windcomer's eyes flash with light, and she woke herself out of her dreamland. He's lying to me, she thought. It's all tricks and illusions he's playing on my mind. He doesn't have the power to turn me into a human, otherwise he would have done it by now. The windcomer already owned every part of her, except for the one thing that was outside his grasp. To give him her soul would be to give up, and even if she changed her mind, there would be no going back afterward. I belong to the sanctifier. My answer is no, she said in a tired yet final sort of way. The illusion shattered. She flooded back into her wolfskin. The beautiful man once again became a horrible metal beast. The windcomer got to his feet. Very well. You leave me no choice. I will do what I must. What is that? Alora asked, her eyes snapping open. He turned his good eye directly on her. I will kill the girl your boy loves, and if you still do not give me your soul, I will kill him too. No, she gasped, rising to her feet. You can't. I will, the windcomer snarled, and he towered over her until she shrunk away, frightened, unless you want to change your mind. You will not own me, Alora yelled, drowning her fear. Then watch them both perish at my doing, he roared. He watched Alora tremble for a bit, tremble so much that it looked like the ground she was standing on was shaking. He began to turn away before he glanced back and said, This will be my last little visit with you next time we meet. I'll no longer be so civil. Make no mistake about it. If this does not convince you to give me your soul, I will kill another and another until this whole forest and the area beyond is covered in blood. If you still refuse, then I will lose my patience and I will eventually kill you. Let your mind meditate on that. Instead of leaving slowly like he always did, the windcomer vanished. When Alora could eventually breathe, her mind raced, unable to keep her thoughts clear. It had finally happened. The windcomer's patience had run out. He was going to kill them. August, Clarette, maybe even more— it would be August's father next, and then maybe those two boys called Todd and Dustin. If he didn't stop there, the whole wood would be slaughtered. There would be nothing left alive. Alora nearly screamed when she thought of what he might be doing right now, but rationality forced herself to keep quiet. The windcomer wouldn't kill them quickly, that was for sure. He would make sure to drag it out while she was clear in sight. Alora knew windcomer wouldn't strike now. He would want to formulate a plan, make sure that his methods were the best possible gamble. Running away wasn't an option. He would find her and herd her back. He wouldn't kill her until he got what he wanted. He would strike her where it hurt most. August and his family broke into Alora's mind, August with his arm around Clarette. Alora realized she had to do everything in her power to protect them. But what could she do? She was no match for the windcomer in her and mortal body, let alone in this mortal wolf's. She couldn't hold him back or fight him off. Their only chance would be to leave. But how? Grim determination flooded her mind, and Alora clenched her teeth. She would make them leave. She would chase them out. A giant white wolf was terrifying enough to anyone, and she was sure Clarette would recognize her. Of course, the chances she would get killed were very likely— but she would much rather be killed quickly by August's gun than to lose her soul or her life to the windcomer. After she was gone, the windcomer would leave the rest of them alone. Humans were of no interest to him. If anyone would murder her, she wanted it to be August. At least she would get to see him one last time. She had to make it to his cabin and force them to run. Tonight— she bolted from the falls and raced as quickly as she could to August's home. There wasn't much time left for her, she knew. She had to give every second she could to August to make sure his family made it out alive. As she ran, it was as if she had never been made mortal. Her breathing remained the same. 
Her muscles didn't ache at all, and the farther she traveled, the more energy she got. Alora was thrilled in this exhilaration, this freedom. It was, to her, the last gift she would ever receive before she died. She was going to her death, but she would still, forever and always, be free. You may have shattered my heart by forcing me to choose, she thought with contempt, but you can never have my soul. She didn't slow down as she reached the cabin. Putting all her weight into the charge, the wolf focused on the living room window. By the look of the glass, the thing was anything but stable. It was nothing like the hardness of the windcomer's eyes. Alora leapt and crashed in through the glass. Clarette screamed. The sight of August, his face aglow from the warmth of the fire, and his handsome features filled with shock, was almost enough to make Alora pause and stare at him forever. Yet she didn't have forever. She had now, and a few seconds was going to have to last the rest of her short lifetime. His father wasn't home. There was nothing she could do about that. She had to at least save these two. Snapping her jaws, Alora started herding them toward the door. It's the same dog that attacked me, Clarette yelled. She tried heading for the gun hanging on the wall, but Alora barred her way, pushing her down with her paws. August yelled and charged at the wolf with a lamp in his hands. Alora stepped aside and grabbed his pant leg, bringing him to the floor as well. That's no dog. It's a wolf, August shouted. He rolled back onto his feet and looked for a weapon, but Alora refused to let him, trying to get them both to move. These stupid, silly humans. Any animal that was being attacked like this would turn away and head for the hills. Why couldn't they see she was trying to chase them off? But humans were not deer, and in this she had made a vast miscalculation. There was only one thing left that she could do. If they wouldn't run from a wolf, they would run from an anmortal. Alora spread her wings, revealing the feathery membranes that had been concealed against her fur. There was pain, but her task was so urgent that she ignored it as she bore down upon them. Their eyes widened in shock, and they shook their heads, not believing, not seeing. You dull creatures, you'll trust your eyes any other time. Why can you never see what's right in front of you? Your lives are in danger. Alora screamed in her head. It was no use, though. Her wings had only managed to keep them glued to the spot. I'll drag you out, Alora thought angrily, looking at Clarette. And to save you, he will follow. Alora lunged forward and caught Clarette by the sleeve and began pulling her out the door. Clarette hit her over and over on the top of her head, and Alora became blinded. There was no way out. She was failing them. It was then the windcomer arrived. He swept through the walls as if they were non-existent, crashing into the cabin, latching on to Clarette with his jaws. The windcomer winked at Alora and headed off in the direction of the lake, Clarette's screaming still in her ears. August let out a great cry, and Alora's heart nearly broke. He turned on Alora and screamed, "'What did that thing do to her, you beast?' He took the gun down from the wall, loaded it with some cartridges in his pocket, and turned it on her. Just as he was about to pull the trigger, Alora screamed, "'No, August, listen to me!' August paused, his mouth dropping open. Alora could hardly believe it. He had understood her. But how? With suspicious eyes, August snapped. Alora? Yes, it's me, she wailed, still surprised she could speak. Whatever you do, don't shoot. Please believe it's me. Her voice was too convincing for him to protest. With shaking arms, the rifle fell from his arms. August collapsed to his knees in tears. Alora, he whimpered. Yes, she said, quieter now. Get up now, August. Your mate is in danger, she said, nudging his arm. He looked up in confusion. Mate? The girl the windcomer took, Clarette, she said. The windcomer? His eyes narrowed, then he shook his head. I'm not dating that girl. 
I haven't gone out with anyone since you left, Alora. She's my sister. His sister? August never had any siblings, as far as she knew. There had been none he had grown up with, and nobody living with his mother. Even though she was an animal, the shock on her face must have been evident. Dad adopted her, he said, last year, when you were gone and after I... His eyes widened. Oh my God, I shot a wolf that looked almost exactly like you once. That was me, she said. You hit me, but I got better. Oh, Alora, he hushed, and he started to cry harder. I'm so sorry. Don't be like that now, Alora said in frustration. Your sister is in trouble. He shook his head again. I tried to find you, to tell you that Dad had adopted another kid, but I never found you. I guess I know why. Alora breathed deeply. There was a reason that August had cared so much for this girl, his sister. The adopted girl had been Alora's replacement, but in a way that was completely different from what she had believed. Alora, August added slowly, why are you a wolf with wings? Am I dreaming or something? Alora grabbed his sleeve and pulled him to his feet. He wrenched his hand back fearfully, as if frightened that she was going to attack him again. She let the fabric fall from her mouth as she said, No, August, you aren't dreaming. I am an immortal, a being that is a human in the spring, summer, and fall, and a beast in winter. Or at least, I was. Her head dropped. I gave up my an mortality in this life to be with you. With me he whispered. I chose to be mortal in this body, though, so I can never change back, she said softly. I'm so sorry that I never told you, but that doesn't matter. Clarette is probably still alive, because the windcomer, the beast you just saw, thinks he can get to me by hurting you. He's been hunting me for years now. If we hurry, there's a chance we can save her. I remember the stories you told me about him. Hold on, I'll follow you. August added, picking up the gun. Alora rose up on her hind paws and placed them on the rifle. No, August. Guns won't work on him. He's entirely metal. August stared into her eyes. So how do we kill him? Alora didn't answer for a minute. I'm not sure, but there has to be a way. Follow me. She led the way out the door, her wings tucked in tightly. She wouldn't tell him that saving Clarette would mean her death. He wouldn't let her go after the windcomer. He would try to take on the monster by himself. Alora snorted at the thought. Killing the windcomer wasn't her objective. Keeping him distracted long enough for the other two to escape was. The only problem was figuring out how to get August to leave her behind. Though she was close to leaving this earth, Alora's thoughts were peaceful and devout. She knew what she had to do, and soon this world's sorrows would never touch her again. She had been wrong when she thought that freedom had been her last gift. It had been August, getting to have one last short conversation with him, making her peace with him, and having him walk silently beside her. A pit of fear formed in her stomach, but it was easy for her to ignore compared to what would be waiting for her on the other side when this shell had finally given her up. There. August pointed at a group of trees. The windcomer had passed through here and had obviously decided to leave out his transparency. Trees lay in shatters, cut in half, a huge road carved straight through the trunks. Some of them still bled sap. Alora climbed around the things sorrowfully and thought, He's decimating my home. Just another way to try and get to me. She followed August's finger past the broken plants and out over the hills, until she saw a long tail of chains flickering over the cliff. He was heading for the lake. Keep up with me, Alora shouted. Though she knew it would be impossible for August to run as fast as she could, Alora traveled full out toward the water and kicking up dead leaves on her way. Once she got to the lakeside, the calm weather changed completely. Rain fell onto her fur as a strong north wind blew. She skidded to a stop on the moist clay, barely saving herself from dropping off the cliffs and into the water below. 
the windcomer, on another cliff a hundred yards away in the depths of the lake, laughed. The rock he had taken his stand on was almost like a small island, and there was no way to get there by land. Alora knew she could no longer fly that far, and there was no way August was going to get there. The boy appeared behind her several minutes later as she was pacing the distance back and forth along the cliff's edge. A summer storm was brewing above them. Give up, the windcomer bellowed, and the waves churned. I always get what I want. Alora looked down, her paws scrabbling for a grip. There was no hope. She was going to have to dive into the lake and pray the power of the storm wouldn't drag her out. There was little chance she would make it, however. Those waves were so large, they would sweep her up in an instant and pull her away. Not to mention the water was deathly cold. If she spent too much time within the waves, she would freeze to death. Even then, she would have to make it to the cliff and climb up it to face him. What other option did she have? She backed up calmly. August yelled against the wind. What are you doing? I'm going to swim to the island, she yelled. Don't try and stop me. What do you mean? Just fly over, he said, gesturing at her wings. I can't anymore, August, she said, and tears filled her eyes. They don't work. I've been crippled by them for months. Have you even tried? he asked. She shook her head. I will at first, but I know I'm going to fall. Let me do this. Stay here and I'll have her safe soon. How she could make this promise, she wasn't sure. The chances of making it to the island were large and long, let alone getting there, saving Clarette, and getting her back to August. But she had to try. I'm not letting you go without me, he protested. You'll only drag me down, Alora said. I might save your life out there. I'm coming in, he yelled. Alora ran away from him, trying to get him to stay behind. She spread her great wings as she hit the air, but it did no good, and she plummeted into the water in one graceful, arced dive. Her lungs gasped as she came up for air, feeling the lake's chilling, icy bitterness. There was not a cold like it on this earth, no way that she could describe the gnawing, aching blizzard that set into her skin and became her bones. The lake was so cold it made her body feel like it was on fire. She would never be warm again after this cold, no chance at all. Alora looked back up to where she had dived and realized with panic that August was not there. She swam in circles, eyes glancing everywhere, until she saw a head sticking out of the water, slowly going under. No! He had left the gun and jumped in after her. Alora paddled to where he was and yelled in his ear, trying to make him stir. It was no use. The jump had been so far and the water so cold, it had knocked him out. Alora held her breath and swam under him. His body lay on top of her back as she looked for a way out. The shore was too far away. Everywhere around her there was nothing but cold, black lake. If she stayed much longer in this liquid that was slowly making her limbs go numb, August would die, and soon she would after. August dying was not the plan. With only one place to go, she fought against the current and made her way toward the cliff the windcomer waited on. Her wings were dragging her down. She tried to move them feebly in an effort to help her paddle, but they did nothing. August came around slowly. He blinked the water out of his eyes and whispered, Alora, I'm sorry. I'm getting us to land, she cried, and fresh water filtered into her mouth. She coughed and August helped her swim, trying to regain his surroundings. Try to swim alongside the waves. They'll push us farther. Alora swam this way and that, but she and August never seemed to get any closer to the windcomer. As her head was forced under time and time again, her adrenaline began to drain. Soon the only thought that kept her flaming muscles moving and her heart still pounding was to get August to land. I was an anmortal once, she thought. I came from the lake. This is where I truly belong, and no storm is going to tell me otherwise. When her head came up from the water for the eleventh time, her paws hit rock. 
Both of them looked up to see the cliff and the windcomer gazing down from it. Clorette's up there, August breathed. Alora nodded and said, Let's climb, August. There's a chance we'll be able to save her. Using their upper body strength, they pulled themselves onto the rock and began climbing upwards, getting sprayed by the lake every so often and gasping from the cold. Alora would have given anything to be warm again, to have this horrible chill taken away from her. If there was one thing she would have placed before this, it was to have August warm, who was starting to turn blue. He wasn't going to make it back, even if they did reach Clarette. Why hadn't he stayed behind like she had asked? Alora slipped. She dug her claws into the side of the rock but began sliding downwards, back toward the lake she never wished to enter again. But before she fell, August caught her, and step by step they scaled the summit together. The windcomer hadn't stopped watching them since they had made it to the shore. Once they dragged themselves to the top of the island, he stepped back and let them lie there for a few moments, waiting. Chapter 13 Fight for Freedom Alora opened her eyes. This is how it will begin, she thought, staring into the windcomer's eye. August and Alora lay there, panting and freezing, while the windcomer stood over them pridefully, an interested expression on his face. The chill must be hard for you, with the wind and water. Let me fix that. The windcomer breathed his hot breath on them, the breath that tasted like smoke and exhaust. Alora and August both coughed, gasping for air. In an instant, they were dry. August clambered to his feet, confused and scared out of his mind. Alora simply shook herself and said, Where's Clarette? What have you done with her? The windcomer said nothing, but moved aside. At the edge of the cliff a few paces away was Clarette, lying down and looking hurt. She wasn't conscious, and her legs stuck out at a wrong angle. When August saw Clarette, he scrambled toward her, but Alora blocked his way. She wouldn't let him get anywhere near the beast. Next to Clarette's head there was a small wooden boat, only big enough for two people. Alora blinked her eyes and shook her head. A boat! How obvious! The windcomer never expected them to swim back. After all, he needed her alive, didn't he? She was so sick of his games. This ends now, windcomer, Alora stated. She was amazed she was brave enough to state his name. You will let August and Clarette go back and never bother them again. She put one paw out and crept down, as if going into a pounce. The windcomer didn't answer, only observed her actions with a hopeful expression. Clarette and I, but Alora, what about you? August asked, panic rising in his voice. This fight was meant to happen long ago, August. I was never supposed to survive it, Alora said softly. What are you saying? he asked a high pitch coming into his tone. Take Clarette and the boat back down the cliff and wait for the storm to pass. You'll make it to shore, she instructed. Just like the windcomer never took his eyes off of her, Alora never took her eyes off of August. I can't leave you, he protested, becoming hysterical. You'll... He'll kill me, she said simply, and the windcomer's one glass eye flashed. But I see now this was always supposed to happen. I have to fight for my kind. I am the last, you know, the last and mortal that will ever be. The words echoed in her head. She wished she had more and mortals to fight beside her now, but she was the last one. She had been the last from the start. The windcomer came forward. He was reserved and quiet, knowing it would all end soon. You can still save yourself, he stated. Give me your soul. Never, Alora snarled. It was too much to ask for. You're just like me, the windcomer said, proud and vain. I never could have gotten you this far if I hadn't cut you down inch by inch. Why do you think I had to eat that thing that you called a horse? His words caused all the air to whoosh out of her lungs, Tears sprang in Alora's eyes. After so many years of forgetting, one word rose up in her mind. Tanglemane, 
She remembered he existed and remembered how much she loved him. Her mind traveled back to that night in the forest when she had first met her enemy, and she cried, You lied to me. That's not the only thing I lied about, he cranked. I know why you can talk now. It's because of the boy. His eye lit up August, and he put a hand on his face to block out the light from the windcomer's eyes. When you chose to be mortal, you made a bond with him. Your love creates magic that enables you to speak. Rage was filling Alora's body, igniting every vein until she thought that not even the freezing cold could touch her skin. Love for her lost Tanglemane and adored August was giving her hope, and in an act of defiance, she put her ears flat against her head and said nothing. Last warning, the beast exclaimed, and his tail of chains rose up in the air. I can make you live forever. It doesn't matter if I'm immortal in this life, Alora said with a touch of ecstasy. I'll soon be immortal forever, a light in the sky, and there's nothing you can do to take that away from me. Her voice had risen to a bold note, and she stood up proudly like the queen she was. The windcomer showed his long, jagged teeth. We'll see about that. The windcomer charged toward Alora. She pushed August out of the way, jumping up in the air and landing on the windcomer's great metal head. When her paws touched the metal, her skin burned, and she screamed out in pain. The windcomer tossed his head. She went flying off, slamming into the ground and barely getting out of the way as he brought his chain tail crashing to the earth. When he saw that he had missed, the machine flung out his giant paw at her. Alora leapt up in the air, using her dead wings to try and propel herself upward. The windcomer stumbled forward and fell onto his face. His teeth missed her by inches as he tried to gobble her whole. Alora danced in front of some very tall pines, swaying back and forth to tease him. His arms swept out again, and she ducked. Her blow was so close, she could feel the metal scrape her fur. His claws tore through the pines, and they fell on top of him, denting his metal body. One false move and I'm dead, Alora thought as she dodged his teeth over and over. He got close enough for Alora to scratch his nose. Her nails dug into the metal and tore it, causing the windcomer to jerk back and flail his claws at her. Alora took her opportunity. She ran under the windcomer's legs, going to his bloated stomach. Alora jumped up and winced as her teeth connected with tough metal, grinding against her mouth as she created a hole. Her task seemed to work. The windcomer let out a screech of pain, so he did have a weakness. The windcomer reared up on his hind legs with a roar so loud it hurt Alora's ears. Once he was standing, she was hundreds of feet off the ground, still hanging on to him with her teeth in his belly. Her panic increased when she realized that he was falling backward over the side of the cliff and into the lakes. Alora, jump now! She heard August scream over the loudness. As the windcomer's body began falling off the side of the cliff, it caused the whole island to shake, the land unable to support his falling weight. Alora leapt off his stomach and scrabbled for a hold on the mudslide that he was creating. The windcomer tried to grab her as he fell down, but it was useless. He sunk headfirst into the lake. Alora was about to slip right along with him until a warm embrace enveloped her for the second time that day and said, I got you. August was hanging onto a ledge with one hand, clinging to her with the other. He lifted her as if she weighed nothing and placed her over his shoulder, scaling up the side of the island and finally getting them both on solid ground. Are you all right? Clarette asked. She had finally come around, wincing from the pain. I'm okay, August said immediately, but it was obvious by the way Clarette was staring at Alora that she didn't mean him. I'm just fine, Alora said, and then she took a double look at Clarette. Excuse me? How did you know I could talk? Clarette giggled. It's a very long story, but after the windcomer grabbed me, I knew that you couldn't just be any wolf and with wings like those. How do you know his name? What's going on? Alora asked, her head swimming with questions. 
August looked just as confused as she did, and slightly upset. Was I left out on everything? he asked. Clarette nodded. Yes. I'm tired of being clueless. Just explain. August prodded. Clarette took a breath. You see, before I was so graciously adopted by your father, I had been an Anmortal too. Really? Alora asked, shocked. August was too stunned for words. He sat back and ran his hands through his hair. Clarette smiled. Yes, about three years ago I made the change from Anmortal to human. You see, I loved a boy too, and I became mortal for him. Imagine my surprise when he didn't love me back. Her eyes became sad, distant. Alora wondered if this was how she looked when she assumed August was seeing someone else. Clarette dropped her head. As a human, I didn't know how to take care of myself. I was found by some people under a patch of trees one day and put into foster care. It's a blessing I was adopted. But why didn't you defend yourself when I attacked you? You should have known how, Alora said. It's been many years since I've been in a battle. I had forgotten how to fight, Clarette said. And I knew by the way you looked you weren't any common creature, but who would believe me if I told them about Anne Mortals? And the Windcomer, it is true, you have fulfilled the stories. What stories? August asked. When I was little and still an mortal, my mother used to tell me a story of a mortal, who used to be an Anne Mortal, who would defeat the Windcomer forever, Clarette said triumphantly. She would be, as she said, the last Anne Mortal that would ever live. Nobody believed her because no one could fathom that the Windcomer could be defeated, and especially by a mortal. I remember most of all that in the story, the Anne Mortal had great white wings that were brilliant and strong. They must have got the last part wrong, then, Alora added. My wings are certainly not strong or brilliant. They're dead. But Alora, August said, your wings aren't dead. Didn't you notice? You never could have jumped so high before. It's impossible. Your wings are working again. Alora blinked at him. What? She whispered. She brought her wings up against the stormy sky and observed them. As a test, she lifted into the air, and her heart, no, her soul, sung as she performed twirls and dips in the sky, taking a blissful flight around the island. She touched back down to Clarette and August, feeling blessed, free. Yes, her wings were indeed working again. Pleased at her recovery, Alora looked at the boat and said, It's over now. We can all go home and... The rest of her sentence was cut off by a great ripping sound, the sound of metal merging and transforming. Water splashed on them from above, and their eyes widened in fear as they watched the figure emerging from the deep. Clarette whispered, No, and put her face into her hands. August grabbed Alora. Alora herself sunk deeply into a depression, losing all hope. She would never wake up from this nightmare. Chapter 14 The Lights in the Sky The windcomer towered over them, not dead, but alive. Yet he was different, entirely changed. He didn't have the figure of an animal, but that of a man. It was the same creature she had seen in her nightmares, a tall copper human with long claws reaching out to grab her, chains clanking on his form, and a great wide mouth ready to swallow her whole. Make for the safety of the boat, Alora said. She leapt up and pushed August away, screaming, Grab Clarette and run! I'll handle him! Just get out of here! Alora, you can't do it, August said. Water was running down his face, and Alora wasn't sure if it was from the rain or the tears he was crying. Alora looked back at him and yelled over the screeching of the copper, If you love me, you'll leave me here. You'll do as I ask. Prove that you love me and obey. August gritted his teeth, but wrenched himself away and began carrying Clarette to the boat. Alora reared up on her hind legs and challenged the windcomer, bringing her wings up to their fullest height. Try to tame me, she screamed, 
and the spray of the lake battered around her. I'm not afraid of you. The windcomer groaned. She saw that his mouth was hot, churning like molten lava inside the depths of hell. The windcomer grabbed the sides of the island with his massive hands and shook it, making chunks of clay go flying. The cliff began to fall apart, crashing into the lake. Alora held her ground until he swept his hand at her. She rolled to the side underneath the blow and jumped up, suspending herself through the air. Alora landed on his hand and began scaling up his arm. She slipped a few times on the burning copper, but her claws dug in. She had to use all the power in her wings to keep her from flying off as he shook his arm to try and break her grasp. Alora flung herself sideways off his shoulder and clawed at his remaining good eye. Alora made direct contact and shattered the glass with her paw. As she did so, shards came flying out toward her and landed in her shoulder, causing spurts of blood to jet out instantly. The windcomer shrieked and shook his head blindly while Alora fell hundreds of feet. She hit the windcomer's knee and began rolling off of it, crunching into the earth while the glass sunk deeply into her skin. Ah! Oh, she yelled. Alora began to crawl away to somewhere, anywhere she could go to lie down, to be safe. Yet there was no safe place. Like struck by some giant earthquake, the island was trembling. Alora moaned on the ground. She heard footsteps in the soil and whipped her head around to see August running toward her. In his hands was a type of makeshift spear, a long, snapped tree branch with an end that was sharpened like a pike. If anyone came near the tip, it would cut them to shreds. August, I told you to leave long ago. Get Clarette away from here, Alora ordered, gritting her fangs. I can't leave you, and neither will she. You and I both know what's going to happen if you do this on your own, he yelled. What do you know? Get in the boat before he sucks this island down, and you with it, Alora said. Not without you. He gripped the wooden stake tighter. Are you silly? What do you think that little twig is going to do? She hissed. Let me help. He snapped. Never. She went to spring away, but August threw the spear down and wrapped his arms around her body, holding her back, though she struggled to get away. August, unhand me now, Alora said, trying to break free. I won't let you sacrifice yourself like this, he said, voice breaking. It's my choice, not yours, she said half-heartedly, pulling away. For the worth of all the world, she loved his arms and how safe they made her feel. She wished this moment could last forever. Do you know how much it hurt to think you were dead? I'm not letting that become a reality. He squeezed her tighter. August, if you love me, she whispered, quitting her struggle and resorting to reason. You'll let me go. I can't. August, she hushed, the gaze that they shared, one that only two lovers could create, blocked out the rest of the chaos. They were in heaven, though the world was falling apart. Let me go, she repeated. August slowly loosened his grip. She slunk out of it, coming around to whisper a small thank you in his ear, before she finally turned to face her enemy once more. The windcomer's blinding had only succeeded in making him more furious. Alora charged towards him with the force of a young champion. Tanglemane was there beside her in spirit, and she was inheriting his bravery, his strength, as she surged closer and closer toward the mechanical beast. The windcomer blindly slapped her away. She went flying towards the boat and smashed against it. Get inside, she could hear Clarette whisper above her. For once, Alora didn't want to argue. She just wanted to obey the voice and do as she was told. She pulled herself up and realized that she couldn't see, that she was as blinded as the windcomer himself. Her paws groped the hard wooden planks, and she felt her way to the boat, trying to slide into the sanctuary of it. Clarette screamed. Alora knew the impact was coming moments before it hit. The windcomer's giant hand grabbed her and pinned her to the ground forcefully, Alora struggled, looking for a way out as her vision faded. You won't escape, the windcomer snarled, and his foul breath made it impossible to breathe. 
Alora coughed, and he brought his face closer to her, angrily taking her as his own. You belong to me. His hand was crushing the air from her lungs. Alora nearly passed out. She wondered when it was going to end, when she was going to die. I belong to no one and own no one, she choked. We are all free. The windcomer snarled. With her paws still pushing against the monster's claws, she yelled the only thing she could think of, her last hope. The stomach, August, that's his weak spot. Aim for the gut. The windcomer's face froze. He raised his other arm to strike out blindly at the ground, but it was too late. August was already there. August plunged the wooden spear into the side of the windcomer. The mechanical man let out a wailing screech. His hand lifted off Alora and smacked onto his stomach, trying to force the contents back in. As the boy pulled the spear out, a giant red gash was left gaping in the monster's side. The gap widened, and Alora's vision fully returned. She saw that inside the beast there was pitch blackness, a deep void. Dozens of lights came flooding out from the center of the crack. The tear flew wide open as dozens of anmortals sprang out of the stomach, one by one. There was a roaring and a trembling as they broke free, greater than the sound of the island collapsing around them. The anmortals leapt off the land and transformed into animals, all with wings, all heading toward the sky. They melded together into the northern lights, beaming across the stars. The storm ceased. As thousands of anmortals were set loose, the sky became nothing but colors, and the windcomer grew quiet. The metal in his stomach shrank and shriveled up, collapsing into itself until his face resembled a very old man's. The windcomer fell backwards, causing giant waves to splash as he sunk into the lake, finally dead. But just before he died, he reached out his hand and grabbed the anmortal who had sealed his fate. Alora! August screamed as the she-wolf was enfolded into the windcomer's tight, cold grasp. Her eyes frightened. She tried to struggle out of his grip, but the fall was too fast. It wasn't long before August saw her head go under, sinking to the bottom of the lake with the windcomer's rusted corpse. August let out a grieving cry. He went to the edge of the cliff and peered into the water, looking for any trace of Alora. There was none. Beside himself with sorrow, August began calling her name over and over. Clarette dragged herself out of the boat and tried to comfort him, lying her hands on his shoulders. They were nearly flung off by the strength of his sobs. All that work for nothing, he whispered. We finally got him down, and he killed her anyway. She saved the Anmortals, Clarette said in a comforting tone. Her race can live on now that she freed them. I don't care about them. I care about her, August said harshly. He wrenched himself away and put his face in his hands. Clarette said nothing. A flash of white fabric caught Clarette's eye. August, she said softly, and pointed upward. He looked over the crevice. Pure amazement bloomed upon his face. I'm dreaming, he whispered. No, Clarette said. She's real. It was Alora. She was no longer in wolfskin, but hovered in the sky against the brilliance of the northern lights as a woman, her anmortality restored. Her hair was trailed over her shoulder in an intricate braid, a crown of silver upon her head. She wore a white dress with a train that touched the water below, her entire form glowing with a clear light. She floated down to August and gazed at him, unable to tear her eyes away. Alora, August whispered, and he touched her face. How can this be real? Alora spoke, her voice full of starlight. In the same way my love for you gave me the ability to speak while a wolf, your love for me has given me back my immortality. she whispered. And mortals can no longer exist in the world. The earth is not as it once was, and it is too dangerous for my kind here, even with the windcomer gone. I cannot live here as an anmortal, but I am willing to become mortal again 
If I can be with you. August took her hands in his. I will never ask you to change for me, but I want to change for you. His eyes gleamed with hope. Can I become an mortal? Alora blinked. August, that is a lot to ask. She hesitated. What about your father? He'll be all right. He and my mother are getting back together. He shrugged. I guess it took over a decade for them to realize they couldn't be apart. He's moving down there to be with her. It's where he belongs. August straightened. But I'm older now, and I know it's time to make my own choices. I choose to be with you. Is it even possible? Clarette said. Alora blinked. I wasn't able to change him before, Alora stated. But with all the immortals here, I believe our magic is strong enough. We can work miracles together that were never possible alone. What about you? August asked, looking at Clarette. Do you want to be an immortal again? She shook her head. I will go back to your parents, Clarette volunteered. I think I'd do better as a human than I ever did as an immortal. I will tell your father you ran off with a girl. She smirked. How are you going to make it back to the mainland? Alora asked. Clarette shakily stood on her bad leg. If you can help me down this cliff, I can row myself to shore. From there, I can call some friends for help. Once Clarette was safely in the boat, August gave her a warm embrace. I love you, Clarette. Don't miss me too much. You were the greatest brother I could ever ask for, and I'll treasure the memories of our time together, Clarette said. I love you, August. She looked at Alora. The end mortal stepped forward. Thank you for being a good friend, even when I was your enemy, Alora said. I'm truly sorry for what I've done to you. Clarette smiled. I accept your apology. It's a great honor to know the last Anne mortal that ever was. As they watched Clarette paddle away, Alora turned to August. Our magic is running out. What do you want? August stepped forward. I want to be with you forever. He swept her in a kiss, running his hands through her hair. The two lovers were carried into the sky as they embraced. Alora kissed August back fiercely, and the glow that covered her body slowly spread to him until both of them were shining bright as the sun. As they pulled away, both were transformed into white wolves, their wings spreading triumphantly as they flew toward the Aurora Borealis. And so the story ends, Clarette whispered. August and Alora joined the other Anne mortals, and the northern lights shone brighter than they ever had before, going dark. The End This has been Alora, written by Megan Linsky, read for you by Candace Joyce. Copyright 2020 by Megan Linsky, production copyright by Megan Linsky.